<laughs> Welcome to this meeting of California Ocean Protection Council. We here at the Natural Resources Agency headquarters in Sacramento are joined by many of our council members as well as members of the public that are joining remotely. If you're tuning in via Zoom, know that there are a couple of dozen great OPC employees with us, team members with us here today, and including members of the public. And so we will have this meeting in hybrid format. Uh, I'm joined on the dais uh, by our my colleague, uh, Council Member Jordan Diamond, and then Katie Landau, uh, who uh, is representing my colleague, uh, Cal EPA Secretary Yana Garcia here today. And we're also joined by members of our council via uh, video. So without further ado, I'd ask our colleague Holly to call the roll. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, let's start with Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Present. Secretary Crowfoot. Present. Uh, council Member Diamond. Present. Council Member Brown. Present. Right, council Member Anna Namark. Present. And then taking over for Anna halfway through, we have uh, Council Member Lando. Present. All right, thank you very much. Well, thanks once again for joining council members. So I'll share some initial thoughts and uh, both um, welcomes and farewells. First of all, we're so excited to welcome back the Lieutenant Governor to serve on our Ocean Protection Council this year. Many of you know that the structure of the Ocean Protection Council has one of its important seats uh, rotate between two constitutional officers of the state, our Lieutenant Governor and our State Controller. And so over the last year, we've been joined by Controller Betty Yee and her team. And of course, now we have uh, our Lieutenant Governor and uh, her uh, key staff member, Matt Dumlau, uh, serving on the Ocean Protection Council. So welcome back. It's great to see you. Thank you very much, Secretary Crowfoot. It's wonderful to be back again. It feels like longer than a year, uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about all the good work you have been doing. Of course, I am always on the State Lands Commission, so uh, we get report backs uh, on your, your work, but it is wonderful to be back in person. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also want to welcome in a new capacity our colleague, Jan Eckerly. Jen was appointed just weeks ago by Governor Newsom to serve as our Deputy Secretary for Oceans and Coasts, which <laughs> and of course that role also serves as Executive Director of the Ocean Protection Council. And so you all that know Jen know of her distinguished career and her leadership. And so we're all so excited to have you in this role. Um, also, as, as is custom with these public boards and commissions, we are planning to transition our public seats uh, here later this winter, and it's an opportunity to thank the two members in these public seats who have done incredible work and leadership for us over the last few years, Jordan Diamond and Michael Brown, uh, just to hear or ex uh, let us express our, our heartfelt appreciation for the work that you've done. I have to say, you know, four years have passed since I've been in this role on, on OPC, and we've got so much done uh, from uh, unveiling a, a new strategic plan almost four years ago, and then just running down the field and actually accomplishing so, so much. And, and Jordan and Mike, you have been a consistent presence, creative, constructive, collaborative uh, throughout. So just want to thank you for the, the, your public service and also you know, provide you an opportunity to share any thoughts that that you might have uh, as we begin the day today. Um, thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, I'll just say my heartfelt thanks for the opportunity to serve on the council over the last few years. I think OPC, the work that OPC does is so incredibly important. And also most people don't know the full extent of it. And that's not a community, it's just, it's so important. And people that obviously have so many things going on in their lives, 
Um, but the, the reach of it is so much further than people can imagine, um, which is the fundamental mission of a cross-agency, you know, a cross-cutting kind of entity. Um, and I think OPC does it in a really incredible way. So it has been a privilege to serve on the council. Um, it's been so wonderful to get to know the staff and to actually know everything that's that's going on. Um, so I will, I will miss you all, but I'm certainly not going anywhere. Um, so thank you again, and Secretary, um, and thanks for the chance to serve. Thanks once again, Jordan. Um, over to you, Mike. I think it's been eight years. It has been more. eight years. It's been incredible to see all the work that is done. And <clears throat> much like Jordan, I've been honored to serve as one of the public members over these past eight years. And I, I want to thank the former governor, Jerry Brown, for initially appointing me and Governor Newsom for his ongoing support of everything that OPC has been doing. Uh, early in my career, I spent eight years in government roles and at the federal, state, and local levels. And I and I had the opportunity to meet some amazing people doing great work. My time, though, at, as a public member of OPC has opened up a window into what I consider to be an example of public service, public sector service at its finest, from the elected officials to the staff, to all the, everybody involved in all the different agencies, absolutely amazing. Um, and, and OPC uh, is just such an unusual um, governmental entity in that it, by being a convener of all things ocean related for California, the breadth of the work, as Jordan said, it's just few of us knew um, how broad it was and having an opportunity to serve as a public member and being involved with all the state and local agencies, the tribes, the Ocean Science Trust, the universities, the nonprofit organizations, and all the residents and, and <clears throat> people who came and spoke before us just absolutely amazing. And, and as Jordan said, the breadth of the issues from ocean acidification to marine reserves to microplastics to better fishing gear. Wow, it's just an amazing um, example of the combination of solid science and the inclusion of voices from across the state to create um, great public uh, policy. And I'm just in awe of what uh, what has been accomplished. I want to I want to thank um, a number of people for the opportunity that I've had. To, first, the folks that I've shared the dais with, um, Secretaries Crawford and Garcia, and their predecessors, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, State Controller Yi, Senator Allen and also public member Jordan Diamond. And I also wanna mention two previous council members who I, I, I gotta say, both of them are heroes of mine in their unwavering commitment to legislating on environmental issues. Former assembly member, Mark Stone and former Senator Fran Pavley, just two giants whose contributions to the council and in the legislature are absolutely amazing. And I, I, was, I was thrilled to be able to sit next to them and, and share a little limelight. Um, I also wanna acknowledge the executive directors who've been um, present during my eight years, starting with Kat Coleman, Deborah Alperstadt, Mark Gold, and now our current executive director, Jen Eckerly. Jen has been there the entire time in various roles. It's awesome to see you in the executive director role. And thank you to Liz Whit <coughs> Whiteman and her predecessor, Skyly McAfee. The Ocean Science Trust is just a treasure, and, and the way in which it works with OPC advances the causes for what we've, what we've been doing. Um, I, I want to, 
also acknowledge that all the people who would speak on all the issues, be they from nonprofits, the fishing community, or just local residents who took their time to speak with us so that we could hear their views and incorporate them in what we, we are trying to do. And I wanna give a special shout out to Richard Sadowski. I think he's been at every single meeting I've been at over the last years. And that in and of itself is just an impressive thing. And his contributions are um, well um, noted. Finally, um, many of my own particular interests, my, my love of the ocean have been um, addressed in many different ways, whether it's measures of ocean health, sources of ocean pollution, providing greater access to beaches in the ocean, getting more uh, social, environmental, and economic value out of, out of the projects that OPC funds. All of that has contributed to making a better marine <clears throat> or helping further the marine environment and, and uh, places that the residents of California can enjoy. Um, it's been a pleasure to serve on the council and I just wanna thank everybody for what they do and especially the staff of OPC who don't necessarily get much recognition, but you guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you. Well, I'm noting a lot of smiles from the OPC team as you said that, Mike, and thank you for your those heartfelt remarks and for all of the time and energy and passion you put into the role over the last eight years. As I move on with my update, I'll note that we said goodbye last meeting to assembly member Mark Stone, who as Mike pointed out is just a, a remarkable OPC member and legislator. Um, we are awaiting the speaker's office appointment of a new council member, and we'll let you know when that happens. It's been a busy fall and winter since we last met. Many of us, including OPC staff, had an opportunity to participate in a large and significant international convening called the Conference of Parties on Biological Diversity or Biodiversity. It took place in Montreal in December, and it brought together all countries of the world to establish new binding targets to protect biodiversity. And thanks to so many, we had a strong delegation from California, including many representing our oceans and coasts. And we were able to highlight a lot of the groundbreaking policy that California has championed, including our marine protected area network. It was a powerful and compelling experience for us who were there. And we are really gratified that at the end of that convening, Essentially, all the countries of the world agreed to hold themselves accountable for reaching their 30 by 30 target across the globe. And as you all know, in California, our governor and legislature are focused on that 30 by 30 target, uh, conserving 30% of our lands and coastal waters by 2030. So that was quite exciting. Also, in recent weeks, actually recent uh, days, the long anticip anticipated decadal review of our Marine Protected Area Network was released. Um, that is a report to our department, or I should say our Fish and Game Commission, that ultimately uh, sets regulations for our MPA network. At its coming meeting, the commission will hear a detailed report on the decadal review. And given how important the MPA network is to the OPC, I'm excited to hear a summary of that decadal review uh, at our next meeting. You know, as we make progress, we continue to uh, pass annual budgets. And so let me provide a quick update on the uh, budget process that just now started this month. Uh, every January, our governor proposes a budget for the legislature's consideration that they need to pass by July 1st for a new fiscal year. Um, on January 10th, the governor actually in this auditorium presented his January 10th proposed budget. After two years of remarkable surpluses in, state, in, in our state budget, uh, we are facing major economic headwinds that are really global in nature that have impacted our state budget. And it requires us to reduce our budget uh, from the last 
uh, annual budget by $24 billion of our general fund. And so the proposal that the governor presented um, while protecting a lot of the funding that we find very important for ocean and coastal protection, it does have uh, cuts in certain areas. And so as it relates to o OPC, uh, the OPC, the, the governor's proposed budget would reduce the OPC uh, uh, budget, <clears throat> budget by $79 million, uh, $15 million from uh, this coming year's general fund, uh, general fund, and then 64 million um, uh, for local and regional adaptation plans. The good news is that uh, this proposal maintains approximately $139 million for our OPC budget. So uh, this budget was one of many across our agency and government that had to take an incremental cut in that proposed budget. But I'll share that we are early in the budget process. And so there's will be a robust conversation between the governor's office and the legislature about funding for oceans and coasts. So while this was um, a, a challenging budget uh, to put together, uh, I'm looking forward to discussions with the, with the legislature uh, around any changes um, they, they see fit to make to the budget. Big meeting today, we're doing a lot. We are hearing when, uh, uh, an exciting report on our first annual State of the Coast and Ocean report. If you recall four years ago when we put together the strategic plan, there was a lot of discussion in part led by Jared Blumenfeld uh, around the need to create an understandable sort of state of the ocean report that your non-experts can, can really uh, use to, to understand um, what, what is the health of our coast and oceans. Californians love our coast, they love the oceans, but it's a complicated uh, place, a complicated set of systems. So this is gonna be the first sort of the 1.0 version um, of, of that which we aspired to almost four years ago. Uh, and then we have a lot of action items, including uh, funding uh, to establish a uh, tribal small grants program and a number of uh, essential programs and scientific investments. So before we get it underway, I wanna provide an opportunity for others on the council to share any updates or opening thoughts that they have before we get underway. All right. Well, as always, public comment is an important part of our meeting. So I want to share a moment. I want to share an explanation for a moment of how we'll do public comment. We'll be taking public. Oh, Anna came on. I was anticipating you may have something to say. Um, <laughs> My apologies, Secretary Crowfoot, a little um, slow on the uptake there. No worries. Um, but really appreciate the opportunity um, just to weigh in a little bit on behalf of Secretary Yana Garcia. Um, first, really echoing Secretary Crowfoot's um, a sentiment in welcoming the Lieutenant Governor back to the council. Um, I also want to heartfelt congratulate Jen on her recent appointment um, as Deputy Secretary for Oceans and Coastal Policy and as executive director of OPC, you know, California's coastal ecosystems are integral to the health of California. We all know that. And, and I know under Jen's leadership, OPC will continue to play a vital role in coordinating efforts of the many state agencies, including those at Cal APA, in advancing the state's ocean policies and protecting this key ecosystem. So congratulations, Jen. Um, really excited for your leadership in this space. Uh, the agenda today highlights several areas in OPC, State Water Board and Cali P, where State Water Board and Cali PA, other BDOs work closely together. Um, I'm going to have to leave a little bit early today, but I wanted to kind of take a moment to acknowledge a few of the areas um, where there's kind of key collaboration happening with our BDOs and OPC including working to advance microplastics research and eliminate microplastics in our oceans and drinking water and implementing the statewide trash provisions for inland and ocean waters. Uh, the State Water Board also continues to participate in statewide leadership groups led by OPC to coordinate management and regulation of marine protected areas and state water quality protected areas, aquaculture and sea level rise. Um, so just super grateful for all of the collaboration there um, to kind of push, push this, um, 
these policy areas in a, in a progressive direction that are protective of our waters. And, and lastly, I wanna commend OPC on their tribal engagement strategy that's before the council. Um, you know, genuine engagement and collaboration with tribes and indigenous communities is so key in fighting this climate crisis that we find ourselves in. And this strategy is really a step towards ensuring they're at the table and really a step in the right direction. So um, congratulations on that. And, and thanks again for having me here today. Anna, thanks so much for your partnership and the partnership of Secretary Garcia. And Katie, thanks for standing in for Anna when she needs to duck out. So let me share just uh, the, the explanation so we can ensure that everybody that wants to make public comment is able to do so. In this agenda, we will be taking public comment after items four through eight, uh, which are specific items uh, before us, an informational item and three action items. For each of those agenda items, we're asking if you do wanna make a public comment that it be limited to the specific nature of those items. Importantly, we have an opportunity to provide public comment on on any subject, any non-agenda issues on item 10. So if you'd like to make a general comment that's not specifically related to one of the agenda items, please be tracking this, the, the, the progress of the meeting and you'll have an opportunity to make, that, make those comments uh, on, on, after item 10 or during item 10. Um, and each of these items that have public comment, I'll invite public comment. If you wish to make a comment and are attending in person, please simply line up next to the podium we will take in-person public comment first. After all in-person attendees have spoken, we will take public comment for, from those joining us virtually. If you're joining, joining us through video, through Zoom, please raise your virtual hand, which is that button on the bottom of the screen, and our folks will unmute you, announce your name, and you will be able to provide your comment to the council. We also allow or enable folks to, to provide public comment by phone. If you've called into the meeting via telephone, please press pound two to raise your hand. Depending on, on how you have accessed the meeting, you may also need to unmute yourself. Public comment is limited to two minutes each so we can make it through the meeting and hear from everyone. And there will be a timer on the screen to track your allotted time. Please, please, if you're interested in providing public comment on the item, raise that virtual hand if you're on Zoom or press pound two on the phone um, by the end of the agenda presentation. That sets the queue for the public comment and hands raised after that time uh, generally are not placed in the queue for comment. So with that said, let me turn it over to Jen Eckerly for your first official uh, uh, OOPC Executive Director Report. Thank you so much, Secretary Krofa, and thank you to everyone for the amazing amount of support. I really appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank uh, and echo Secretary Crowfoot's thanks to both Council Members Brown and Diamond for their service and their leadership on the Council. Um, we are definitely going to miss you. Um, and I want to extend a warm welcome back to the Lieutenant Governor. Our agenda today reflects extraordinary steps to advance priorities, all of our priorities. And I, I want to start by thanking the entire OPC team for their work in getting us here today. All of the items on the agenda are important, but I wanna take a moment to highlight a few. First, our annual coast and ocean report. As Secretary Crowfoot mentioned, our strategic plan includes a commitment to report annually on progress towards meeting our strategic plan goals and critical issues impacting California's coast and ocean. Last year, our report, our report focused mainly on a retrospective of OPC's activities and accomplishments. This year, our report includes a summary of our 2022 accomplishments and also a, a suite of pre preliminary indicators that provide a snapshot of ocean health in California. Indicator development was a collaborative effort uh, between OPC staff and our 2022 summer interns in partnership with the West Coast Ocean Alliance. Indicators were chosen based on data availability and the ability to leverage other efforts. I'd like to thank Steve Weisberg for his substantial contributions to the report and to Justine Kimball for helping lead this effort for OPC. I also wanna thank Stacey Hayden, our communications manager for her masterful editing and design of the report. The indicators in our report represent a critical first step to understand status and trends of ocean health. However, they will continue to be refined over the next three years 
with the aim of completing a scientific approach to grading ocean health for our ocean health report card in 2025. Justine will provide more detail on in her presentation for item four. Next, we are so proud to have OPC's first ever tribal engagement strategy on the agenda today. This strategy, which was developed in close collaboration with tribes, is the culmination of over a year's worth of work that included listening sessions, government to government consultation, and revision based on feedback by tribal leaders. If approved, the strategy will strengthen our engagement, communication, and partnership with California Native American tribes. A huge thanks to Mike Escrow for leading this effort and to Geneva E.B. Thompson, CNRA's Assistant Secretary for Tribal Affairs for her input and guidance. Now I just wanna draw everyone's attention to some new findings in our staff recommendations. OPC's equity plan directs the inclusion of findings in our staff recommendations that describe equity and environmental justice considerations for proposed projects and policies. You will see these findings included in all staff recommendations for this meeting today as a summary at the beginning of the document and as a standalone section that ties the project components to the goals in the equity plan and to our strategic plan. This action reflects an important first step in equity plan implementation as we initiate other key near-term priorities, including the development of environmental justice policy and advancing our environmental justice small grants program. Next, just to put a finer point on, a, on a, a, some great news that Secretary Crowfoot shared, I'm happy to share that the state's first decadal management review of our marine protected area network was just released in mid-January. Written by the Department of Fish and Wildlife with input from OPC and contributions from key partners, the review includes findings on progress towards meeting the goals of the Marine Life Protection Act, challenges and knowledge gaps, and recommendations for adaptive management. It also provides a summary of California's incredible MPA management program and the remarkable group of partners from community members to federal agencies whose expertise, resources, and commitment are foundational to the lasting success of our MPAs. Our MPA network has set the gold standard for marine conservation across the globe. And while monitoring results are complex, the science outlined in the review shows that MPAs are improving ocean health. I wanna thank the Department of Fish and Wildlife for their hard work in developing a document that showcases where we are and critical next steps for adaptive management. The review will be presented um, at the February 9th Fish, Fish and Game Commission meeting here in this room with a public symposium um, in Monterey on March 15th, followed by the Fish and Game Commission's meeting of their Mar Marine Resources Committee and that meeting will be dedicated um, specifically to a discussion about the review on March 16th. A quick update on 30 by 30. As you recall, OPC is serving as the lead for implementation of the state's 30 by 30 effort for coastal waters. In December, we hosted a virtual roundtable to share our strategies and solicit feedback on how to best engage with interested partners. In the coming weeks, we will share additional opportunities to participate in further discussions on 30 by 30 implementation. We're also very excited about a recent discussion that we had with leadership from the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary and the opportunity to leverage their upcoming update to their management plan and align the state's 30 by 30 efforts with sanctuary management priorities for strengthened biodiversity protection. And now I'd like to share just a few updates on personnel. I want to take a moment to thank our 2022 Sea Grant Fellows, Megan Williams and Elise Gowen. They're sitting here in the front row. Uh, over the last year, they have made meaningful contributions to our work, particularly on sea level rise and marine protected areas. You will hear presentations from both of them on item six. These are efforts they led to solicit and select projects that will increase understanding of climate change impacts and build coastal resilience. Friday will be Elise's last day at OPC. I can't believe it. Uh, we will miss her and we are wishing her the best in this next chapter. For Megan, I am thrilled to share that she has been hired as OPC's Coastal Adaptation Program Manager. This is a two year limited term position that will help us lead our efforts to support local and regional sea level rise adaptation planning 
and she will start in this capacity on February 6th. As our twin, yes. <laughs> Uh, as our 2022 fellows transition out, we're getting ready to welcome in our 2023 fellows, Ben Dorfman and Katie Seary. Ben will be joining our climate change team on February 1st. Ben has a master's degree in environmental in, in international environmental policy from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, where his research was focused on coastal resilience, climate change adaptation, and the blue economy. And while at OPC, he will support our sea level rise and coastal resilience work. Katie will be joining our biodiversity team on March 6th. Katie has a master's degree from Moss Landing Marine Labs, where her research focused on fisheries and conservation biology. Katie has helped monitor our MPA network as part of California's Collaborative Fisheries Research Program. And at OPC, she will support development of new tools and approaches for MPA monitoring into the future. We are looking forward to having Katie and Ben join the team. Lastly, on personnel, just a few job opportunities I'd like to share. First, we will be looking to hire our new deputy director as soon as possible, um, and we will share the job announcement on our website and listserv as soon as it's available. Second, in the coming days, we will be reposting the job announcement for an environmental scientist in our biodiversity program. This position, this position will lead efforts to restore coastal habitats, strengthen conservation at the land-sea interface, support our MPA management program, and improve coastal and ocean monitoring. And third, by spring, we hope to post two limited-term environmental scientist position to help advance our work on 30 by 30 for coastal waters over the next two years. These positions will support stakeholder convenings, ongoing communications and outreach, tribal listening sessions, coordination with agency partners, and efforts to fill critical research gaps. For the end of my report, I just want to take a moment to provide a look ahead at our investment and policy priorities for this year. This list is not exhaustive, although it might seem like it is, <laughs> and it will continue to be refined by this council and by emerging needs. As we launch into 2023, we are committed to ongoing efforts that advance equity with tribes and communities that are burdened by environmental and social injustice. This includes implementation of our equity plan and our tribal engagement strategy, should that be approved by the council today, and embedding equity into all of our programmatic work. And we will continue to prioritize actions that can serve coastal and marine biodiversity and build climate resilience. This includes investments in habitat conservation and restoration, including eelgrass, wetlands, beaches, and dunes, investments in additional research and restoration methods for kelp forests to inform the state's kelp restoration and management plan, addressing plastic pollution through further implementation of California's microplastic strategy and our ocean litter strategy, updating the state's sea level rise guidance and establishing our SB1 grant program to fund local and regional sea level rise adaptation planning and projects, ongoing MPA management, building on the decadal management review recommendations, and including the development of an updated long-term monitoring action plan in close partnership with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, outreach, collaboration, and research efforts to further 30 by 30 implementation, development of a comprehensive environmental monitoring plan for offshore wind, and completion of several important statewide policy and strategy docu documents, including an aquaculture action plan, a restoration and mitigation policy, a climate resilient fisheries strategy, a wetland action plan, and a beach resiliency plan. We truly look forward to the council's ongoing leadership and continued collaboration with all of our partners as we work together to protect the health of California's coast and ocean. And with that, thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. Any questions from council members for Jen's report? Jordan. Uh, this is less a question, but more more comment. I did want to wait until Jen gave her report. Um, just to add on, um, my congrats to uh, well, to the agency and to Jen for for putting her in this position. I think the vast majority of the time, you find someone who specializes in the nitty gritty details, or someone who knows how to really manage and empower a team 
or someone who can think kind of strategically at a high level and develop the partnerships needed to really make change. And Jen brings all three. And I cannot imagine someone better situated with better experience, better know-how, better talent, better skill um, to lead OPC into the future. Four years ago, when we were looking at the strategic plan, Secretary Crowfoot, Secretary Blumenfeld, all of us were really pushing the question of how OPC, OPC can be as proactive as possible. Not just responding to, okay, they hear some needs that, that have been voiced or et cetera, but really how can we lean in and anticipate what the greatest needs are, what the greatest policy opportunities are. And Jen has been critical to the momentum that the, the council has achieved over these last few years as reflected in in the updated approach to, to the annual report. So I just wanna say thank you, Jen, for everything you've done and will do, um, and just voice my incredible support for this decision. Here, here, well put. Thank you so much. Let's move on to Liz Whiteman, who of course leads our Ocean Science Trust for her executive director's report. Thank you, Chair Crawford, council members. Also extending my congratulations to Jen in this venue, although I think I've said it 17 times at this point. And, and as you know, commitment to our partnership. There's a lot you listed out to do, so let, let's do it. <laughs> Um, so getting straight into just two highlights, building on, on Jen's, um, starting with something relevant to your strategic plan goal one, safeguarding against climate change and specifically building resilience to sea level rise, coastal storms, um, erosion and flooding. The OPC OST convened a sea level rise task force continues its work on track to update the state sea level rise technical guidance um, for completion later this year. The focus we have at the moment is uh, incorporating the latest understanding of sea level rise drivers into a set of future scenarios uh, with projections for the California coastline. And in the coming weeks, these are going to form the basis for moving to the next phase of work, which is understanding how those translate into and interact with other physical impacts on the landscape. You know, following the atmospheric rivers of the past weeks, I think we all have a renewed appreciation for the interplay and the impacts and harm caused um, but interplay between sea level rise and other coastal processes now, as well as into the, the future. So I'll take this opportunity to highlight some really cool work uh, released last week on the hazards presented by rising groundwater. The Pathways Climate Institute, San Francisco Estuary Institute, and collaborators from UC Berkeley that include task force member, Dr. Christina Hill, have produced some novel maps that show where shallow groundwater tied to sea level rise is an issue today and where it's likely to be a concern in the future as seas continue to rise. And if you think traditional levees and, and floodwaters currently designed to keep coastal um, floodwaters flood walls designed to keep coastal floodwaters out may not provide protection from rising groundwater, leaving communities at risk of flooding. And it's such a privilege to work alongside the experts on the task force and in the broader California science community who are both advancing our scientific understanding of this complex future and actively working to develop guidance, tools, and resources about how actually to use this science in, in decisions like these maps. Um, so I encourage folk to check out the story map produced by the partners on this effort that is available in a couple of places, um, but one of those is the San Francisco Estuary Institute website. And I'll keep the council um, updated on the progress of the Sea Level Rise Task Force um, through this year. Then switching to my second highlight um, related to goal three um, and to protect coastal water quality, although honestly this is an important issue in a number of places of the strategic plan, many of you likely saw the media coverage last year about the deep ocean DDT dumping in Southern California. An insecticide um, banned since the early 70s because of harm to wildlife and as a potential human carcinogen, discovery of more than um, and larger than documented dumping really thrust this issue back into the limelight. 
But um, in parallel, recent research also illuminated um, new, quite frankly, scary um, aspects of this deep ocean DDT, a much broader suite of DDT breakdown products and related byproducts, um, more than 45 compounds that are now collectively referred to as DDT plus that may have toxic effects and have not really historically been monitored um, in the environment. So the unknowns about this deep ocean DDT plus instigated a, a, a call to action um, from researchers, um, national and state leadership, and the broader Southern California community. And in response to that, the USCC grant program based in Los Angeles and the um, California Sea Grant program based in San Diego jointly conducted a community-driven research needs assessment um, last year, and the report from that work was also released last week. Now, this report provides a pathway to inform transparent and inclusive research investment decisions and eventually management decisions about what to do uh, about deep ocean DDT plus contamination. It really incorporates a broad range of um, perspectives and it's super way cool technical term um, because it's not just a list of what we need to know, but a strategic approach about how we most effectively invest to grow our knowledge over time to get to collaborative solutions. So, because story maps, the story map on this on um, the Sea Grant Joint website is also super way cool, and I encourage folk to to look at that. Two next steps to highlight briefly. Later this week, Ocean Science Trust in, is hosting a briefing in partnership with USC and California Sea Grants and Assembly Member Lowenthal to, with expert panelists, including Jen, thank you, um, to share more from the report um, and discuss next steps. Registration for that briefing is available via our Ocean Science Trust website. And then I did just want to mention that the State Water Board, University, uh, the USC Sea Grant and California Sea Grant are jointly soliciting applications applications for um, research awards to fund up to 5.2 million in projects that will improve um, regulatory outcomes on this important issue. And this matches an equivalent federal investment. To close on this topic, I, I feel um, it's imperative to note that this issue is definitely a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and all partners in this work know that alongside uh, thoughtful research investment, we need sustained co communication and coordination with local communities as we build our understanding of collaborative options to, to take action. And finally, I'll close as a transition to your next agenda item um, in saying that the, the OPC Science Advisory Team, um, which I'm pleased to chair, it was um, it, thrilled to be able to provide support on um, the development of indicators for your current ocean and coastal report. And we're very much looking forward to digging in further. It's no small challenge to uh, identify a limited set of indicators to track ocean health and the impact of policy actions. But as hopefully shown by my previous two updates, and as you'll hear more from Justine in just a moment, I think the, the depth and breadth of our partnerships, our science partnerships in the state give us a really amazing jumping off point for, for future work on that. And that's my update. Thank you. Dr. Wyman, thanks so much. Any questions? All right, then let's move on to item number four, which is an informational item presented to us by Dr. Justine Kimball, who's our senior program manager at OPC. And she'll uh, share with us a summary of the annual state of the coast and ocean report. Thank you and good afternoon council members. Uh, and thanks to Wade and Jen for teeing this item up so well in your intro remarks. Um, my intro slides um, have mostly already been touched on, uh, but I will touch on them again uh, briefly. Uh, next slide. As is mentioned, this is directly tied to our strategic plan. This uh, report 1.0 will eventually uh, lead to our ultimate goal of a, a full report card by 2025, utilizing a scientific indicator-based approach to grading. Next slide. And as you heard from Jen, this report builds directly on this uh, on last year's report, and I think shows a lot of progress. Uh, next slide. 
and was a truly collective um, effort. Uh, huge thanks again to Steve Weisberg and, and Stacy for her wonderful formatting. <laughs> um, and uh, development of indicators um, really is a challenging effort. It requires high quality monitoring data that is both spatially and temporally robust. Typically, a decades long time series is required to assess a trend. So developing these scientifically sound indicators that can be assessed statewide and on an annual basis is, is a really big lift. Um, so again, we see this uh, report uh, 1.0 as, as a starting place uh, to further build on. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to provide a quick overview of the indicators and accomplishments for each goal, but please see the report for more detail. Uh, so for goal one, our safeguarding in the face of climate change goal, we have included an indicator on sea level rise, which highlights the general trend of increasing sea levels. Sea level rise planning tracks the level of planning documents across our 76 coastal jurisdictions and finds that while most jurisdictions do have local coastal programs, the vast majority do not include consideration of sea level rise. Ocean acidification trends are currently focused on the Southern California Bight with plans to expand statewide. We expect the trend of acidifying waters in Southern California to also be true uh, statewide. And finally, coastal wastewater recycling shows that recycling incrementally increased um, between 2019 and 2021, with the highest rate of water recycling taking place in Southern California. A few highlights from our goal one accomplishments uh, include adoption of our first ever sea level rise action plan, two competitive Prop 68 solicitations, and implementation of standardized methodology collecting ocean acidification, chemical, and biological monitoring data. Uh, next slide. Goal two, our equity goal includes our beach water quality indicator, which is part of our goal two objective to enhance healthy human use of the coast and ocean. Beach water quality was found to be relatively good, remains unchanged during summer swimming seasons, and most fecal contamination was found to be concentrated in small geographic areas. Uh, interns and staff did initially pursue additional goal two indicators, such as coastal access. However, that got complicated really quickly, and uh, we have a plan to work with subject matter experts to specifically build out goal two indicators in 2023. Uh, lots of accomplishments here to highlight, though. The success of the Tribal Marine Stewards Network was apparent at, at the October meeting when OPC invested additional funding to continue and expand that effort. In August of 2022, OPC and CNRA leadership joined the Wiat tribe and its partners to celebrate the tribe's purchase of one of the last pieces of undeveloped coastal wetland and upland in their ancestral territory. And finally, adoption of our first ever equity plan. Next slide. Uh, goal three, our biodiversity goal, included indicators on harmful algal blooms, which found that some harmful algal species habitat is migrating northward, and a new domoic acid hotspot has emerged on the north coast. The kelp indicator highlighted the devastating kelp loss following a recent marine heat wave. The marine mammal indicator shows how the Marine Mammal Act has been successful in stabilizing many marine mammal populations. However, strandings are an ongoing threat that could increase. Many accomplishments, again, to highlight investments in climate resilient MPA research, small grants, fisheries monitoring and outreach, in innovative kelp monitoring and restoration techniques were piloted and show a lot of promise. And finally, adoption of the first ever microplastic strategy was a milestone. Next slide. Uh, goal four, our blue economy goal, includes an indicator on fisheries landings that shows the highly dynamic catch levels varying through time. However, we realize this doesn't tell the whole environmental story, and we'll be working on refining how we visualize the fisheries impacts and communicate what they mean for the ecosystem and associated communities. Accomplishment here, accomplishments here focus on a lot of interagency collaboration on offshore wind and associated investments, as well as progress towards the aquaculture action plan. Next slide. So looking ahead, I completely agree with uh, Liz. We have plans to leverage the SAT and we had a really great first meeting with them. So they're aware of the effort and they're excited. And so we, we plan to lean on them to build a comprehensive list of indicators in 2023. Uh, we will likely need um, some funding to, to pursue additional data analysis and, and collection uh, to develop indicators and continue to incorporate those um, 
in the 2023 report. So far, we, we haven't had any funding towards this effort. Um, and we've built a really great partnership with the West Coast Ocean Alliance, uh, which is pursuing the same goal of a report card for the whole West Coast. And so we can continue to plan to lean on them and partner with them on the effort so that we're California is aligned with the whole West Coast as we pursue indicators. And that's it. Next slide. Happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Justine. Any questions from our council members? I'll just commend you and the team for putting this together. I'm really excited with uh, with this product and, and where we're ultimately going towards this so-called ocean report card. And I like how understandable both the initial indicators are and then the points of progress. Uh, because as you know, everything we've been trying to do is really based on our strategic plan to hold ourselves accountable to make the progress we want to. So I'm quite encouraged by the presentation. Thank you. And we are trying to tie the indicators to the strategic plan as well as general ocean health. So we're keeping both in mind. Thank you so much. I think uh, Mike has a question. Uh, I, uh, more of a comment and a really big thank you. I, I go back to my very first meeting where I remember talking to Kat and Jen about some kind of ocean health um, report card. And this far exceeds my expectations for what, um, what could happen. Uh, I, it, it's just fantastic. And really just seeing you and all the folks who worked on this have done a terrific job. I do have a question in what um, the indicators, I, as you've explained, are at different levels of um, development, so to speak. I, it, how are you thinking about when to put the indicators into uh, full action? It, it, it strikes me that better to have you know partially developed indicators and start tracking them and continue on the development process than just waiting to do it but what are you thinking well our our ultimate the strategic plan goal is for the 2025 due date so definitely by then to have it comprehensively built out. Um, but, you know, the scoring is, um, you know, a really complicated thing. You have to not only have the monitoring data to assess trends, but you have to have a baseline in which to reference that. And then you have to choose or have some sort of scientific grounding for what your thresholds are for different scores. So we have started early conversations there, but, you know, it's, it's something that we would want to get much broader input from before we would feel comfortable releasing any sort of scores. Um, so I think we'll probably continue to build out the indicators in the way that they are now, just really focusing on the trends for at least the next year or two, and then you know really look to that 2025 date to have the scores built in. But you know that could be something we could revisit if we want to put some some of the more score-based indicators in there earlier, but but it is very difficult to do well. Yeah, and I'll just observe, you know, this it's it's a science and it's a bit of an art to really distill the health of such a complex set of systems into something that's understandable and digestible. So thanks for taking that on and appreciate the thoughtfulness that you're um, you're pursuing this with because we really want this to be durable. We definitely want this to be a contribution we make to, you know, future you know, OPC work. So very much appreciate that. I want to make sure we call uh, for members of the public who have uh, specific comments on this annual state of the coast and ocean report. If you're interested, if you're here in our resources agency headquarters here in Sacramento and you want to share public comment, please come up to the front, to the podium. If you're joining by Zoom, click on that virtual raise hands. And if you're joining by phone, please press pound two on your phone. And our colleague Holly will call any public comment. We have no virtual public comment for this item. Okay, thank you very much. And let's move on to, thank you very much, Justine. Appreciate the work of you and your team. Let's move on to agenda item number five. 
the consideration and, and potential approval of OPC's tribal engagement strategy, as well as disbursement of funds to establish a tribal small grants program. And this advances uh, one of our strategic goals specifically focused on advancing equity across ocean and coastal policies. And we have Mike Gascor with us. All right, well, good afternoon, Secretary Crowfoot, um, council members, Mike Escrow, Senior Biodiversity Program Manager and Tribal Liaison. And today I really could not be more excited um, to present on some work that I think is gonna really break new ground um, in our relations with tribes here at OPC. So next slide, please. So I think we always have to start from a place of saying that tribes have stewarded California's coast and ocean, thank you, Holly, um, <laughs> since time immemorial, um, but that a history of genocide, of dispossession, of forced removal um, of tribes from their ancestral territories that was perpetrated by the state um, has harmed both people and nature. Next slide, please. But the Newsom administration has taken really bold action in recent years to start to right those historic injustices. And so guided by that vision, OPC has developed our first ever tribal engagement strategy which will serve as a framework for enhanced partnership between tribes on everything that we do for coastal and ocean protection. The strategy complements the equity plan that OPC adopted last year, and specifically it supports objective 2.1 in our strategic plan on enhancing engagement with tribes. Next slide, please. So I wanna really highlight how collaborative this effort was. We developed the strategy in very close partnership with tribes and we really, felt it was important to give this process the time that it needed. So we started by holding early consultations and listening sessions way back in fall 2021. And those early discussions were focused on two key themes. First of all, what are tribes priorities for coastal and ocean protection? Um, and then second, what are best practices for really respectfully and efficiently engaging with tribes? And so based on that feedback, we kind of went to the drawing board and developed a draft strategy, which we then put out to tribes for a further consultation and listening session last year saying, what do you think of this document? What did we get right? What did we get wrong? Let's draft this together. Um, and so we are incredibly grateful to tribes for their partnership, for sitting down with us, for sharing their thoughts and perspectives, um, for their candor. And we're also very, very grateful to Assistant Secretary Thompson, as Jen mentioned in her opening remarks um, at CNRA for her guidance throughout this process. We could not have done it without Geneva, um, as well as the Governor's Office of Tribal Affairs. This document was reviewed and approved by the Governor's Office. So we are um, incredibly grateful to Secretary Snyder and her team over there as well for their support, their edits and their guidance. Next slide, please. So this strategy contains three major sections. And first we thought it was really important to start from a place of what are our guiding principles? What are our values and our best practices that will underpin all of our engagement going forward? So some examples include acknowledging the history, all of the harms, um, recognizing the diversity of tribes in California, and of course, always consulting early and often with tribes um, and understanding the serious constraints on tribal capacity, especially at this moment in time. Next slide, please. And then we sort of get to the meat of the strategy. What work are we actually gonna get done together? Um, and I wanna say that these specific actions are all based on the priorities that we heard from tribes in those consultations and listening sessions over the last couple of years. So some examples include providing new funding opportunities to tribes, um, supporting land back and co-management efforts. So more of what we saw with the Wiat tribe acquisition, improving coastal and ocean access for tribes. And just to highlight quickly, on that access piece, um, we've had a recent request from a tribal leader to strengthen the language in the drafts or in the final strategy um, on tribal access for ceremonial and research purposes. So with your permission, we'd like to make that small edit um, before we finalize. Next slide, please. And last is a set of approaches for improving our communication with tribes. So OPC will primarily communicate with tribes, of course, through government to government consultation, um, but we're also gonna pursue other complementary approaches as appropriate. So some examples of that include respectfully visiting tribal ancestral territories, getting out to meet with tribal communities in those territories, um, yeah, meeting in person, sharing a consultation calendar early each year, again, going back to those capacity constraints, how can we best support tribal planning efforts? Um, and of course, using a variety of outreach and communications tools at our disposal not always relying on formal channels, but also pursuing other um, options based on what individual tribes preferences are. Next slide, please. 
So should the council adopt the tribal engagement strategy today, um, we will start working in partnership with tribes to begin implementation. Um, and this is gonna include prioritizing specific actions year by year, developing clear milestones and timelines for how we'll track progress towards those actions and identifying required resources, funding capacity needed to get this work done. Um, we are committing to assessing this strategy every year and evaluating progress in partnership with tribes and of course, updating the strategy as needed. It can be a living document. Um, but one initial priority that we'd like to move forward with today is the launch of a tribal small grants program. So similar to the environmental justice small grants program that OPC adopted last October, um, this program will provide dedicated funding just for tribal governments and tribally led NGOs in support of tribal priorities for the coast and ocean. Um, and we're coordinating with Assistant Secretary Thompson uh, to leverage this small grants program with the broader 100 million um, nature-based solutions program that she is leading. Next slide, please. And a grantee um, to be identified based on these um, capacity and expertise needs will work in close partnership with us, of course, to successfully administer the program. Next slide, please. So today I'm recommending that you adopt OPC's tribal engagement strategy and direct us, staff, um, to work with our partners, especially, of course, our tribal partners, to implement the strategy. Next slide, please. And to approve the disbursement of up to a million dollars um, to establish a tribal small grants program, again, with the grantee to be identified. Next slide, please. So I'd like to close um, by sharing a conversation that I had last week with a tribal leader um, who reminded me that when we talk about healing, we often just talk about tribes needing to heal from this historic trauma. Um, but he reminded me that the state really needs to heal from this trauma as well. He said that we carry a soul wound. That's the way that he described it. Uh, and those were really heavy words to hear. I'll, I'll be honest. And they really stuck with me. But this leader reminded me that healing can't be done in isolation and that we have to heal and grow by working together. Um, so I'd like to humbly submit this strategy today as a step towards that vision. Thank you. Mike, thanks so much for, for all the work on this. And I have some thoughts, but let's first turn to public comment. So again, if you're in the room and you would like to provide public comment, please come up to the front. If you're on Zoom, click that virtual raise hand button. And if you're joining by phone, pound two to provide any public comment. Holly, uh, has anyone queued up for public comment? Secretary Crofit, I have one person in the queue, which is, oh, now we have more, but first it's going to be Megan Roca and then Caitlin Gaffney, followed by June Shrestha. Uh, Megan, you have the floor. Megan, you're still on mute. Ayukui. Hello and good afternoon, Chair Crowfoot and members of the council. My name is Fawn Murphy and I'm the chairperson for Resigani Rancheria. Resigani Rancheria is a federally recognized tribe of Yurok people and a founding partner in the Tribal Marine Stewards Network. As you know, tribal people have inherent rights, responsibilities and obligations to take care of our homelands and waters. We take this responsibility very seriously as demonstrated through our ceremonies and our use of indigenous traditional knowledge to steward both our natural and cultural resources. The Tribal Marine Stewards Network aims to return the management of our ocean and coastal territories to California tribes. Here at Resigani Rancheria, we have worked closely with OPC staff over the past few years to create a network that builds the capacity of each tribe and moves us towards the goals of co-governance and true tribal management. We see OPC and the state as our partners in this endeavor. The adoption of the tribal engagement strategy today sets us on this path. It also furthers Ocean Protection Council's strategic plan, particularly goal two and objective 2.1 to enhance engagement with tribes. Quite frankly, OPC staff have already been doing this work, but we are happy to see it in a strategy to be adopted by the council and to be used by future staff and future council members. As human beings, we tend to complicate things and make them more complex than they need to be. But really, it is quite simple. Tribal people have always been here. We have always taken care of our lands and waters and the ability to fully do that has been taken away from us, but it's time to give it back. 
Thank you to the council and OPC staff for taking this important step forward and in the right direction. We fully support the staff recommendation to adopt the tribal engagement strategy and direct staff to work with the agency and our partners to implement the strategy, as well as improve the disbursement of $1 million to establish tribal small grants program. Waklau. Thank you so much, Chairperson Murphy. Our next speaker is going to be Caitlin Gaffney, followed by June Shrestha. Uh, Caitlin, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank the Ocean Protection Council staff and all of the tribes and tribal representatives who worked so hard over the last uh, many months to develop the tribal engagement strategy and voice resources legacy funds support for adopting the strategy today. Um, I wanted to particularly support um, the commitment to assessing progress and adapting over time um, as lessons are learned and additional feedback is received um, on the plan as it's put into practice. And then I also wanted to encourage the Ocean Protection Council to work with your partner agencies at the state, particularly in the coastal and ocean space, um, to share lessons learned and best practices as this engagement strategy unfolds. I think it will have a lot of benefit um, even beyond OPC itself. So thank you again to the staff and all of the tribes who participated. We look forward to seeing this plan uh, help guide your work in the years ahead. Thanks, Caitlin. Our last speaker is going to be June. June, you have the floor. Hello, my name is June Shrestha. I work for the Ama Mutsun Land Trust, which is a tribally led nonprofit in Central California that supports the Ama Mutsun Tribal Band. I'm just calling in to show support for the adoption of the Tribal Engagement Strategy and the Tribal Small Grants Program. I wanted to express appreciation for all the work that OPC has been doing to work with California tribes on the objectives outlined in the document and into the future. We appreciate the attention uh, that you put on working with both federally recognized tribes as well as not federally recognized ones like the Amamutsun Tribal Band. And you know, reading through that tribal engagement document from a personal side, I really appreciate that specific line item that acknowledges constraints on tribal capacity and efforts to improve efficiencies, such as working with other state agencies to combine these consultation opportunities. I think that's a really important one. And like uh, Caitlin was just saying, like that idea of, of you all sharing lessons learned as well. And with the Tribal Small Grants Program, we appreciate the dedicated funding that includes both tribal governments as well as tribally led non-governmental organizations such as the Amamutsun Land Trust. Funding from OPC in the past has been critical in getting the Ocean and Coastal Stewardship Program at the Amamutsun Land Trust off the ground. And we hope to see opportunities continue for native communities and tribally led nonprofits in the future. Thank you so much for your time. June, thank you very much. So that concludes public comments. Um, I'll just emphasize sort of how you left, uh, how, how you finished the presentation, Mike, and, and that is just the importance of this work. I am certain that the most important steps we take uh, here at our time and, and the Ocean Protection Council is to reestablish tribal leadership stewarding oceans and coasts. And I think whether it's the tribal land return to the Wiat tribe or the establishment of the Tribal Marine Stewards Network, I mean, these are steps that are long overdue and uh, long lasting. And so I'm excited that this tribal uh, engagement policy is all about institutionalizing that work. And we're gonna see more of these concrete actions moving forward. I'm also really excited about the small grants program and the comment I'd have there is let's make sure that we limit barriers to access. We've heard from so many that sometimes the requirements, the processes that state agencies require for grant funds or, or transfers is so onerous that it actually discourages folks from using that or organizations from using that or governments from using that. And so we'll obviously take care to avoid that. I think I'll lastly say that I was moved that Governor Newsom ended his second and final inaugural address actually sharing his experience with Yurok leadership uh, on that dugout canoe that you shared a, a photo of 
um, and spending time with them actually on the Klamath River, understanding the health of that river, the history of that river, the connection of the river to the ocean. And then fast forward to just a couple months ago when he stood with tribal leaders uh, to memorialize the final approval to take down four dams that have injured the health of the Klamath River. And that will be the largest river restoration project in the history of the United States with obviously benefit to the ocean and fisheries and salmon and cultures. So we are on a journey with much work ahead of us and I'm thankful and humbled by the progress. I'd like to share, I'd like to turn to the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you for the opportunity just to say a few brief words. I simply want to thank uh, all of the representatives of the tribes who work with staff to get to this point. And I want to thank our staff for the uh, sensitivity and the uh, focus and the many, many conversations that it takes to put a document like this together uh, and for the commitment, the ongoing commitment to work with tribal leaders. Every tribe in California has a different structure, different leadership, a different history, different kinds of expertise. And we know that all of it is extremely important and valuable. And so uh, moving forward with not just, again, the, the wonderful opportunities the Tribal Small Grants Program will, uh, will present itself, but really all the opportunities for mutual engagement and understanding. Uh, it's a very uh, exciting thing, and I look forward to uh, everything this uh, this uh, report and the programs that will go along with it uh, will bring to the protection of California's oceans. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council Member Brown. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mike, and the rest of the folks who worked on this. Um, this is an extraordinary step and uh, <clears throat> brings um, brings California into a new era. I love seeing it and I, and I um, think it will be a, in some ways, game changer across large portions of the state in the relationships between um, the general population and the individual tribes. Um, one suggestion, though, to think about is I, I didn't see anything in the strategy about communication with the general public about what is what the tribes are doing and what OPC and other agencies are doing around coastal issues. And, and, uh, <clears throat> um, and I think that could be a very helpful thing to let communities know uh, about these efforts, um, and it, particularly as projects um, gets get up and going, um, it's a it would be a great uh, opportunity to educate folks about the contributions of the tribes and and what's going on. Thanks. Thank you, Mike, and I would concur. That's as that is some constructive feedback. You know, other governments, of course, at the local level and the federal level, regional level, uh, have their own relationships with tribal governments and tribal communities, and it's really important that we convey um, the, the tribal leadership on ocean and coastal protection, um, so that we continue to to build recognition of that, not only across our agency and our government, but of course all governments and communities. So thank you for that. Yes, Jordan. Uh, thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, just three quick things. One, um, underscoring the point that was made. I think the most one of the most powerful things is that this encapsulates things that the OVC is already doing. And Mike, you get a huge amount of credit for this. You've been leading this for years. And thank you for the care and respect that, that you've put into these efforts. Um, another underscore, um, just so you can see how I'll vote on the Tribal Small Grants Program, I just want to um, emphasize the fact that this grant program is being set up to support the work that advances the tribe's priorities for coastal and ocean governance. 
um, not just um, the state or us, right? But actually putting those priorities first. I know there's a lot to be figured out in terms of how to administer the program, et cetera, but I look forward to seeing the details about how that's gonna operate in practice. Um, and the third, actually going back to um, how how much work you have you specifically Mike have done in this area, um, the question about the annual assessment of how things are going and how to adapt over time. Any if you if you have additional info to provide at this point in terms of what you think that'll look like, just looking at the long term sustainability of this. Right, we want this to be forever. You know, not to put too much pressure on you, um, but we want this to be forever. And if someday you weren't the kind of the one leading it or you kind of that turnover just thinking about how that annual evaluation and assessment is going to continue so if you have anything more to say on that great otherwise just thank you for your work on this yeah well, well thank you council member diamond um i have some initial thoughts i mean i think this is something that we need to work out in partnership with tribes but um you know the tribal engagement strategy kind of reads very much of like it's a long list of actions that section specifically is a long list of actions that we want to undertake and we didn't set timelines or prioritize on purpose because we wanted to work all of that out in partnership with tribes as we went forward. So I think that through our work on this, through our work on MPAs, um, some other things, we've established really good inroads with tribal communities where we can kind of have this core group of folks that we can come to every year and say, okay, as a group, let's see, you know, how are we doing? How did we do last year? How are our priorities this year different from what our priorities were last year? What has changed? What's evolved, right? Um, but I think institutionalizing that process as much as possible is going to be key, and also making sure that we're not only always talking to the same people, right? We're very, very grateful for the tribal partners that we work so closely with, but we know there are other tribes on the coast and even inland with connections to the coast that might be missing from those conversations. So I think those are the two biggest things to wrap in: is how do we, yeah, institutionalizing it um, and bringing in new voices as well. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank Mike. you. Thanks. So we're at that moment of the discussion where I would entertain a motion to approve the tribal engage, engagement strategy as well as the, yeah, the yeah. as well as the tribal small grants program. Is there a motion? I'm honored to move it, Mr. Thank Chair. you. Thank second. you so much, Lieutenant Governor. Second. It looks like we have we may have a second from happy to second. Happy to from uh, Council Member <laughs> Diamond. So Holly, if you can call the roll. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis? Aye. Secretary Crowfoot? Aye. Council Member Landau? Aye. Council Member Jordan? Aye. Council Member Brown? Aye. The council has voted unanimously. The motion passes. Congratulations and thank you. That is a big milestone. So now we move to item number six, which advances two goals in our strategic plan. The one focused on protecting ecosystems and communities in the face of climate change, and the other to enhance our coastal and marine biodiversity. And this is an item in two parts. Um, both items consider and potentially approve disbursement of funds um, provided to us from Proposition 68, which was a general obligation bond measure. Um, the, the first part of our presentation, 6A, uh, in which Megan uh, Williams, our, our climate change Sea Grant fellow, will present, uh, is related to projects that increase the understanding of climate change impacts and build coastal resilience. The second part, 6B, which Elise Goyne, uh, who's our biodiversity Sea Grant fellow, will present, is Prop 68 funding, but another chapter, Chapter 9, funds that improve understanding of MP, marine protected areas and climate resiliency. So there's a, there's a lot of different uh, proposed uses of funds to work through, and we're excited to hear about each one. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for that introduction. As he mentioned, my name is Megan Williams, and I'm the 2022 Climate Change Sea Grant Fellow, but soon to be the Coastal Adaptation Program Manager for OPC. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the Prop 68 Chapter 10 a suite of projects that are six that I'll be talking about. Next slide. Up. I'll just lean in <laughs> for some quick background. Is that better? Okay. Proposition 68 was approved by voters in June 2018. Chapter 10 of Prop 68 allocated $21.2 million to OPC for projects that assist coastal communities and adaptation to climate change. In 2020, uh, 15 coastal resilient projects were selected, totaling $8 million that were distributed. Next slide. 
For the 2022 solicitation, the overall objective was to build resilience on the coast to assist coastal communities in preparing for and adapting to the impacts of sea level rise, which directly ties back to our strategic plan objective 1.1. Within the solicitation, we had four uh, specific priority areas for the projects. The first three were research-based priority areas uh, and included coastal habitat mapping, better understanding and characterizing contaminated sites, and understanding socioeconomic impacts of sea level rise, including impacts on coastal recreation and tourism. Next slide. Oh, sorry. The first, fourth priority area was for implementation projects, which focused on, uh, on the ground, providing on the ground resilience to climate change through restoration and or habitat enhancement. Next slide. This is the solicitation process and timeline. As you can see, we had a lot of interest. Uh, we received over $78 million in uh, requested funding at the letter of intent stage and around $25.5 million in funding at the full proposal stage. We had four separate review panels for the four different priority areas that consisted of OPC staff, academic scientists, subject matter experts, and state agency staff that scored the proposals based on the evaluation criteria found within our Prop 68 guidelines. Final section of the projects were made after interviews and site visits with the finalists, and the six projects I will be discussing here were ultimately selected by OPC staff and the executive director based on review panel scores, as well as consideration of the diversity of project types, geographies, and OPC's priorities. Next slide. Here's a table of the six projects that I'll be going through in more detail uh, from this, but just to show that um, the total project cost here is just under 6.5 million. Next slide. The first project I'll be presenting on comes from the Coastal Habitat Mapping Solicitation Priority Area. This project will investigate how sea level rise will impact rocky intertidal habitats and species which are particularly susceptible to sea level rise impacts. The project will cover all rocky intertidal areas in the state of California. Drones will be used to create a high-res digital elevation map, or DEM, and for the Species Habitat Association and Tidal Range data, the project will utilize the Multi-Agency Rocky Intertidal Network, or MARINES, 25-year data set. The DEMs will then be combined with the marine data set to produce a species distribution map based on current sea levels. As a final product, this project will provide a tool that can be used to predict geographic consequences of sea level rise to the community of species that live along the coastline through a species distribution modeling. A very preliminary example of this can be seen in the next image, if you could just click once. Uh, this basically shows the effects of sea level rise on mussel abundance for four sites in San Diego, the four different colored lines being the four different sites. So the user will be able to select the sites and the species and see the future projections as sea level rise increases. Next slide. The second project here also comes from our coastal habitat mapping priority area, but it focuses on California sandy beaches and dune habitats. This project will develop and test new drone and high-res satellite imagery approaches in order to characterize and map the dynamic features and zones of sandy beaches and dune ecosystems. The project will cover 12 beach and dune sites across Northern, Central, and Southern California. Ultimately, this project will evaluate how proxy sea level rise events, such as king tides, can be monitored via drones and be used to project beach and dune ecosystem change into the future. This project plans to directly engage with stakeholders through the implementation of a California Regional Coast SNAP program. This tool will allow for repeated data collection from beaches by community members and visitors who utilize the Coast SNAP app and permanent photo stations to take images of a beach from a fixed location over time. The benefit of this Coast SNAP network is that it will provide useful data for researchers while also documenting coastal change and the impacts of climate change over time available for anybody to view. Next slide. The third project was selected from our contaminated sites priority area. The main objective of this project is to categorize, characterize, and map hazardous material that is at risk of flooding by 2050 around San Francisco Bay. It will prioritize sites based on the nature of the site and severity of the flood risk. Recognizing that many toxic waste sites that are vulnerable to sea level and groundwater rise are near disadvantaged communities, one of the criteria this project will use to identify and profile the project sites is the site's proximity to disadvantaged and severely disadvantaged communities. Ultimately, this inventory will lead to a database tool that will allow a user to sort sites by category of their choice, such as proximity to disadvantaged communities, toxicity type, or potential exposure pathway. The research team at UC Santa Cruz and UC Berkeley will partner with the San Francisco area-based community nonprofit, Green Action for Health and Environmental Justice, who has been working on the issue of the impact of sea level rise on toxic sites in historically disadvantaged communities in the SF Bay area for the past seven years. Next slide. 
Our fourth project comes from the final research based priority area, which was the socioeconomic impacts to sea level rise. This project will integrate economic and physical vulnerability data to estimate impacts of sea level rise on the coastal recreation and tourism economy of California. While California as a whole is the ultimate goal, the project here is a pilot project that will study Santa Cruz first. Climate vulnerability will be assessed using the best available science to determine changes from historically observed conditions, as well as model projections based on wave climate patterns and sea level rise. For this portion of the project, Save the Waves will part be partnering with Integral Consulting and Dr. Dan Reineman from CSU Channel Islands. For the economic portion of the project, the project intends to not only determine the current economic value of these coastal locations, but all the, also the potential economic value by communities that are not currently accessing or using these coastal resources. This requires understanding socioeconomic and cultural barriers to these locations for disadvantaged communities, along with understanding the non-economic cultural values to the project sites. The research team will collaborate with Black Surf Club Santa Cruz to create and implement the project's outreach strategy in order to capture these priorities. Next slide. The last two projects I'll be talking about today are from the implementation project priority area. This first one builds on a previous Prop 68 grant that was funded by OPC for initial planning and design of a Bayshore Bikeway Resiliency Project. The San Diego Bayshore Bikeway is a heavily used recreational corridor that is adjacent to the shoreline of San Diego Bay. The, pro the proposed project will retrofit a 1.2 mile segment of the bikeway to provide coastal flooding resilience to the severely disadvantaged Bayside community in the city of Imperial Beach. The project intends to integrate a living shoreline and living levee to protect the Bayside neighborhood from future impacts of sea level rise to 3.5 feet. Additionally, the project will mitigate existing compound flooding within the Bayside neighborhood by daylighting an underground stormwater conveyance system that will ultimately create a new multi-purpose multi treatment basin that will serve as a new joint use park for the community. The 1.1 million for this project will be used to complete phase one of the project, which is completion of the final engineering plans, along with continuing the extensive out outreach within the Bayside community. Once final engineering plans are complete, the project has secured 15 million in FEMA brick funding for the permitting and construction phase. Next slide. The final project is another project that builds on a previous Prop 1 grant funded by OPC. This project is the final phase of a multi-phase water quality restoration and adaptation project in Big Canyon Nature Park. This 60-acre open space is located at the downstream end of the Big Canyon watershed in the city of Newport Beach. Big Canyon has been degraded by numerous well-documented impacts and requires habitat restoration and enhancement to improve the site's biological productivity and ecological function. For phase three, which I mentioned is uh, the final phase of this project, restoration of 14 acres of historical salt marsh will be performed, along with establishing a transitional wetland habitat. The project will extend the saltwater influence into the project limits to allow the tidal extent and inundation increase with sea level rise. Transitional zones will allow for the migration of salt marsh vegetation and future sea level rise to improve the overall resiliency of the salt marsh in Upper Newport Bay, and also support sensitive coastal habitats and species. Through CDFW's Cutting the Green Tape initiative, this project qualified as a statutory exempt restoration project under CEQA. Next slide. So with that, the recommendation is for just under 6.5 million in Prop 68 Chapter 10 funding for these six projects to build resilience on the coast to assist coastal communities in preparing for and adapting to the impacts of sea level rise. And with that, uh, next slide. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very, thank you very much. Let's go to Elise to provide the presentation on the next four items and then we'll uh, group our public comment and questions. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Crowfoot and members of the Council. I'm Elise Cohen, one of the 2022 California Sea Grant Fellows at OPC, and I will be presenting on projects selected to discover the nexus between MPAs and climate resiliency. Next slide. These projects are aligned with objectives from all four OPC strategic plan goals, mainly the projects support Goal 1, Objective 1.4, and Goal 3, Objective 3.1. Next slide. The funding for these projects, as mentioned, will come from Proposition 68, and we will be using Chapter 9 funds. OPC received $35 million to support ocean, bay, and coastal protection priorities, and this is the first competitive call for projects in Chapter 9. Next slide. 
The solicitation priorities for projects came directly from the Climate Resilience and California's Marine Protected Area Network Report, which was written by Ocean Science Trust and OPC's Science Advisory Team in 2021. This report relays important research needs and recommended actions for supporting a climate resilient MPA network. We highlighted three needs that are timely and relevant to prioritize for this round of funding. All projects selected needed to be research-based and aim to answer one or more of the following. Ecological resilience through climate refugia, model habitat and species distributions, and or social values relating to MPAs and climate resilience. Next slide. This entire process took six months from solicitation release to this very council meeting. We received 33 letters of intent 12 full proposals, resulting in four projects that were selected for potential funding. Next slide. Through these projects, OPC will be partnering with researchers from Oregon State University, UC Santa Barbara, and UC Santa Cruz, as well as outside experts who have been selected for their experience in conducting research in the MPA and climate change fields. This is an overview of the projects that I will share with you all now. Next slide. The first project will award up to $620,000 to Oregon State University to conduct a management strategy evaluation in California's MPA network to evaluate different management options that managers could take to protect species and kelp forest habitats. This type of evaluation is crucial to choose the, the, choose the most beneficial management actions for a threatened ecosystem under a changing climate and to preview the effects of those actions before implementation. This project team will look at climate projections, purple sea urchin grazing rates, and availability of marine resources important to coastal communities to discover how MPAs can provide protection. A web-based monitoring tool will be made available to the public to explore the effects of various management actions on kelp forest ecosystems. This work will be instrumental to predict which management and restoration actions will lead, will lead to the greatest resilience to climate change. Next slide. The second project will award up to $634,000 to UC Santa Barbara to forecast targeted species distribution as a response to climate change and calculate the risk posed to fishing communities. This analysis would include an assessment of how current MPAs will or will not protect these targeted species under future climate conditions. The project team will integrate ecological, socioeconomic, and climate data across California to create maps of future fishing grounds and use it to rank the most vulnerable fishing communities when it comes to climate-induced shifts. This work is needed to prepare for shifts in marine resources and regulation changes within and outside of MPAs, which may affect the livelihood of the fishing community. Adaptation strategies will be developed and shared with resource managers to mitigate any serious ramifications. Next slide. The third project will award up to $615,000 to UC Santa Cruz to examine the social values that MPAs provide and how a changing climate will alter these values for coastal communities. This project team will focus on diverse and disadvantaged groups in Central and Southern California and will obtain information associated with culture, activities, important species, habitats, and risk perception related to climate change. Climate forecasting data and interviews with community partners will inform a cross-cultural comparative survey instrument that will be used to survey 600 individuals. These first-hand responses and ecological data points will advise an evaluation of the role of MPAs in supporting community values in a changing climate. Adaptation strategies will be co-developed with local leaders and can strengthen the bridge between resource managers and the public. Next slide. The fourth and final project will award up to $528,000 to UC Santa Barbara to understand how MPAs with beach and surf zone ecosystems can adapt to future climate conditions. Indicator species of the beach and surf zone, such as the ones shown on the right, are important for conservation efforts due to their vulnerability to climate change. This region is under threat from encroaching urbanization and future climate regimes will produce habitat squeeze for these species and the communities who may depend on them. 
This project team will evaluate how well NPAs may support these species using maps that utilize projected climate-induced habitat changes. Community and citizen science data will inform the distribution of California grunion species, a fish that relies on beaches and surf zones for the continuation of its species. This is remarkable given that grunion data can only come from citizen scientists. Co-developed management strategies will bring together resource managers, stakeholders, and landowners for the future success of this region. Next slide. To review, we recommend that $2.4 million go to the following grantees to pursue the nexus between MPAs and climate resilience. The funds will come from Prop 68, Chapter 9, and these projects will satisfy multiple OPC strategic plan objectives, mainly Objectives 1.4 and Objective 3.1. Next slide. In conclusion, these four projects will begin to tackle climate change res resiliency relative to MPA protection, which was unconsidered in the original MPA design process. Results from these projects will provide information needed to better integrate climate protections into MPA management, and we will understand valuable implications to society and coastal communities. These projects are a step forward in incorporating habitats, communities, species, and climate impacts into the adaptive management of the state's MPA network. The Decadal Management Review, released earlier this month by the, De the Department of Fish and Wildlife, also highlights climate as an important knowledge gap. And with these research projects, the state can begin to move forward and strengthen the MPA management program to increase MPA enjoyment for all. Next slide. I'd like to thank the council for your continued support on this. And I'd also like to thank the researchers and scientists on these projects for your collaboration with OPC. Thank you so much, Elise. And thank you, Megan, both for your work preparing the, the recommendations and your speedy but thorough uh, journey through, I think, nine, 10 uh, recommended uh, allocations. So first we'll move to public comment. If you wish to comment on uh, this item number six, agenda item number six, or any of the specific grant recommendations, please uh, either punch pound two if you're on a phone, your virtual hand if you're online, or come up to the podium if you're in person. So we'll take our in-person comment first. Welcome. Hi, thank you. I'm Laura Walsh. I'm with the Surf Rider Foundation. We have 18 volunteer chapters who are dedicated to protecting their ocean and beaches all across California. And I'm here because they support projects like the ones mentioned in 6A, their nature-based resiliency projects for the coast. Um, and generally the projects presented capture monitoring and planning and design. Um, but our chapters are currently reeling from the effects of the current storms. And um, everything we're getting from them tells us that we could use more planning and more any efforts that the state can dedicate to help them with coastal resilience. And as Advisor Whit Whiteman um, said this morning, you know, the interplay between sea level rise and these storms is really clear, um, but not to everyone because there was a proposed state budget that slashed the coastal resiliency budget in half. Um, and, you know, even in a state deficit where climate issues are getting cut by about 11 percent, a 45 or 50 percent budget cut is is really huge. And it affects the way the effectiveness of these projects and the way we can be effective with coastal resilience overall in the state. Um, and so I really appreciate Secretary Crowfoot's comment that this is only the beginning of a budget process. And this morning we submitted a letter with 35 other organizations um, that are really calling to restore the coastal resiliency, the coastal resilience budget. And with regards to some of the amazing projects that were pre presented, you know, a lot of them would be, you know, improved with further funding. So for instance, I live in San Francisco where contaminated sites are being studied and the budget for wetlands projects in San Francisco was just completely almost completely eliminated. So we really wanna see a restoration of that funding and just appreciate all the work being done here. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of Surfrider's work and those comments. Let's move to Holly for any virtual comments. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. We have two virtual comments. The first is going to be Lily Mulligan, the second, Ricky Erickson. Lily, you have the floor. Thank you and good afternoon to all. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot and council members. 
My name is Lily Mulligan, and today I'm representing and speaking on behalf of Wild Coast, an international team that conserves coastal and marine ecosystems and addresses climate change through natural solutions. Wild Coast would like to verbally support all of action item number six, but especially item number 6B, the approval of disbursement of Proposition 68 Chapter 9 funds for projects that improve the understanding of MPAs and climate resiliency. The robust management, community engagement, and restoration projects under consideration will increase capacity for the understanding of California's MPA network and consequential climate resiliency. This will be instrumental in predicting the impacts of climate change throughout California's coastal ecosystems and the role MPAs play in building resiliency for these habitats and species. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is going to be Ricky Erickson. Ricky, you have the floor. Hi, thank you. Fantastic set of presentations. And thank you to all of the OPC council members, staff, and partners. I'm Ricky Erickson, Director of Marine Programs for the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation. And we applaud your unyielding support for the California network of MPAs and appreciate approval of funding for both understanding of MPAs and climate to prepare for climate change and build ecological and social resilience for our coast and ocean, a deeper understanding of the ways that people perceive and value resources and the roles that MPAs play in protecting these values. And enhancing adaptation is needed right into the breadth of issues that we all are currently facing and we'll build an understanding of how MPAs should consider climate change in their management to promote ecological and social resilience thank you for all of what you do in support of our ocean thank you so much that will be, please, sorry, Hallie. No, that is all of our public comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's then turn it back to the council members for any questions or comments. I have just a, a, some comments and then a small question. Um, one comment is this is, I think this is just what OPC does so well, which is bring its own scientific and policy expertise to understanding where we should spend state funding with academic uh, scientific community partners to better understand how we take care of the ocean from sea level rise and how we manage our MPAs. I wanna acknowledge the, the comments around the state budget. Um, not only is this the beginning of the conversation, I think a lot of folks were excited that Governor Newsom actually uh, mentioned the, his interest in exploring potentially a bond measure uh, for these types of uh, this type of funding with the legislature. I'm particularly excited about some of the community partnerships that uh, will uh, materialize through these proposals, including um, the one in Santa Cruz with the local uh, surf club, I think the Black Surf Club. I think that those types of um, unique partnerships are great and really all about bringing coastal communities together to better understand impacts of climate change. I'm also really pleased that community science is finding its way into uh, these proposals, both through Coast Snap. Uh, where we can, you know, each of us can play a role in understanding how the sands and the dunes are shifting. And then also the, the, uh, with monitoring grunion populations, which leads to my sw small question. So as a layperson, first of all, what is a grunion? And secondly, why does it need community science to uh, uh, measure its population uh, health or whatever it's measuring? Okay, there we go. Um, grunion are really cool fish that actually spawn on the beach. So in order for them to reproduce, they need to ride the tides, it, the tide in onto the sand. Um, and it's a really cool process and they lay their eggs under the sand. And then with the next high tide, those eggs will go back out to sea and grow and prosper. Um, so in order to see them, you need to be there at the right time. It's usually um, like midnight, <laughs> really late at night. And a lot of citizen scientists come out and record those numbers and see it happening. Thank you very much. I, I see, uh, let's go to Lieutenant Governor and then we'll go to Council Member Diamond. Uh, no comments other than just very important work and 
And, and I'd also just like to call out Surf Rider uh, because I haven't been here for a while, but certainly you participate over at State Lands and and just all your volunteers and, and all the folks who work so hard uh, for your participation and for being here in support of this item today. Thank you so much. Council Member Diamond followed by Council Member Braun. Great, thank you. Um, first, I wanna echo great job on the presentations as Secretary Kofit said, um, getting through a lot and um, quickly, but understandably. I also wanna second um, the emphasis on community science. It's really great to see that. It also, Grunion Greeter might be the best job title I've ever heard. <laughs> um, so excited to see that in any documentary review. Um, the one question that I have is actually about 6B1. Um, and because so much of that does focus on kelp um, and urchins, which um, we have obviously discussed a lot over the last few years, major issue of the last decade, et cetera. So um, I was wondering either Elise or anyone else who's been working on the kelp programs, I'm trying not to say Mike, um, <laughs> <laughs> over, over the last few years, if you could talk just a little bit about the interplay of how that fits into our the broader support that we've put in, been putting into kelp and urchin removal over the last few years. Yeah, I might um, I might ask Lynn Bonito to come up and help me answer this one, but okay. this specific project is to focus on management actions, and they're just using kelp forest ecosystems as an example and a pilot for that. Um, Lindsay, did you want to add? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there'll be a lot of coordination between the ongoing work that um, Mike is leading, and um, we want to emphasize that there's going to be a lot of coordination between all of the approved groups themselves. So um, specifically for the kelp uh, work, they're going to be reevaluating the monitoring approaches that we've taken thus far and how to adapt it moving forward, and that will definitely inform the kelp action plan. And a lot of the, the partners and collaborators are very similar and work together very closely, so there'll be a lot of touch points um, throughout the course of the project. It's fantastic. Just the level of coordination I would expect from you guys, but thank you very much. For yeah, that's a great point, and I just want to emphasize that what Elise ended on, which is I think we're all excited to absorb, understand the decadal review of the MPA network. And I think early indications, at least my understanding is just demonstrating the success of the network and in, in many places along the network to actually have outcomes that we had hoped for. That being said, there are certain um, gaps of information or things that we still need to know that will inform just how we adaptively manage the MPA network. And I think this proposed funding is really critical because we'll take the decadal review, but then of course the question that gets asked is, well, how do we adaptively manage where possible to strengthen the MPA network? And a lot of the science that this is enabling, it, my understanding is that that's gonna help answer those questions for us. Good, uh, Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you. Um, I, most of my comments were already made by uh, other council members, but I'm gonna add a couple of things. Um, first off, the diversity of the project grants is amazing, and I think really great to see in terms of just covering a really broad spectrum of different things that, um, if all works out well, may provide um, data and information and strategies for application and a whole lot of other places. So great job, OPC staff. Um, two comments. When I was a kid, I remember going with my parents to the beach to go grunion hunting. <laughs> and um, it's been a long time since I've gotten up in the middle of the night to go see grunion, but it, obviously a critical indicator species. Um, to that point, uh, this past weekend, I was on several beaches that I hadn't been on since the storms that hit um, our part of the coast. And there is, in a number of places, absolutely no sand left. It's just all rocky intertidal zone, particularly you saw it when super low tide uh was happening and consequently in particular 6a2 um the kind of interplay of beaches and socioeconomic value when there's no sand there aren't a whole lot of folks that are going to go to the beach to go sit 
with their kids on rocky tidal areas. Um, expect it all comes back as spring advances into summer, but who knows what's gonna happen with climate change. Um, and we may be seeing uh, even greater retreat of beaches, sandy beaches than we have seen before. So this is, I think, a really critical issue. And then on 6.4a, um, as a surfer, I think it's very cool to do this study. Uh, and, and I also want to second that reaching out to new groups, there are, I, I am seeing so many different kinds of faces uh, that I used to never see out in the water. It's, it's a really cool thing. But most of them aren't organized. And I would um, hope that the Save the Waves folks, um, not only working with the Black Surf Club in Santa Cruz, but wherever they're working, figure out ways to reach communities that don't, don't necessarily, aren't necessarily organized into a club. Um, surfers sometimes are communal and other times tend to be loners. Um, anyway, great projects and I'm looking forward to voting on them. Thanks so much, Mike. So we are to that moment where I would entertain a motion to approve the projects. Uh, so move for can, uh, approve. All right. And, and council member Brown, I, I just wanna confirm the motion would be I move to adopt the proposed findings for all projects as recommended by the staff, approves the project as described and delegate to OPC leadership the authority to implement the council's approval. Does that sound like a motion to you? That sounds, that's my motion. Great, thank you. And then seconded by council member Diamond. Holly, please call the roll. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Aye. Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. Council member Landau. Aye. Council member Jordan. Aye. Council member Brown. Aye. The council has voted unanimously. The motion passes. Thanks so much. And thanks for the, all the work. Uh, Lisa and Megan. Let's move on to item agenda item number seven, which is specifically an item that advances our uh, goal, our strategic plan goal around coastal and marine biodiversity, specifically focus on microplastics. So this is an action item. It's the consideration and potential improvement of dispersing funds to address past plastic pollution and implementation of our microplastic strategy and ocean litter strategy. And we have Caitlin to present this in three parts, a competitive call for microplastics research, supporting the development of a plastics monitoring network, and then technical support and implementation for LA County single use plastics ordinance. Welcome. Wonderful, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Crowfoot and council members. My name is Caitlin Kalua. I'm the water quality program manager for OPC and presenting on today's agenda item number seven, which is previously described also an action item. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the projects brought before you today uh, support strategic plan goal three to enhance coastal and marine biodiversity, specifically the following targets to address trash and plastic pollution under goal 3.4 to improve coastal and ocean water quality. Next slide, please. Plastic pollution is pervasive, persistent, and only anticipated to grow as plastic production increases um, with most recent estimates of global plastic production um, entering, excuse me, of global plastic pollution entering the world's oceans only anticipates to triple by year 2040 if no intervention takes place. Meanwhile, plastics and microplastics are often ingested by marine life, cause harmful impacts to both individual species as well as entire marine food webs through food dilution, tissue translocation and inflammation, impaired growth, and reproductive impacts. Excuse me. Microplastics have also been found in human stool, lung, placenta, and even blood samples indicating the potential for human health impacts. And critically, plastics are not only a waste problem, but a climate problem due to the greenhouse gases emitted during production, as well as the end of life cycle when plastics break down. Next slide, please. That said, recent efforts by OPC have included the um, release of a precautionary risk assessment framework to assess microplastics in the marine environment, which was uh, released by the OPC Science Advisory Team, facilitated by the Ocean Science Trust, as well as the statewide microplastic strategy that was adopted by this council uh, February of last year. It was the first of its kind in the nation, if not the world, 
um, that outlines a comprehensive prioritized research plan to better understand the sources, pathways, and risk of microplastics in the environment, as well as si simultaneously advancing early recommendations to prevent microplastic pollution. Next slide, please. To advance these research priorities and fill the identified critical gaps in microplastics knowledge, OPC staff, in partnership with California Sea Grant, seek to issue a competitive research solicitation to improve microplastics understanding and management in California. The solicitation will focus on improved understanding and management of specific microplastic sources, understanding of e ecological sensitivity, as well as seek to inform the use of structural low impact develop development, LID, as a form of green infrastructure to intervene and prevent microplastics from reaching California aquatic environments, consistent with recommendations outlined in the statewide microplastic strategy. Next slide, please. We seek the approval of a disbursement of over $1.3 million to fund research and administration of these projects by California Sea Grant. If approved, the research solicitation will be released in the coming week with projects reviewed by a technical review panel convened by California Sea Grant and recommended projects brought back to this council for approval during the August 2023 OPC meeting. It's important to note that OPC and California Sea Grant are also awaiting the results of a federal funding proposal to expand the scope and scale of the research solicitation to physically pilot low impact development projects in urban watersheds. Potential applicants will be notified if additional funding um, is available for this solicitation prior to the full uh, proposal deadline this spring. Next slide, please. Next, item 7B, a key target of both the OPC strategic plan and statewide microplastic strategy is the development of a statewide monitoring network to evaluate both a large plastic and microplastic pollution, essentially to understand the extent of this contamination, but also to track California's progress in reducing plastic pollution. To meet this objective, we're seeking approval of two separate disbursements of up to $750,000 the first, the Southern California Coastal Research Project Authority, known as SQRP, to evaluate and standardize novel microplastic sample collection methods. This project will be supported in partnership with the State Water Board. Second, we seek approval of up to $750,000 to the San Francisco Estuary Institute, known as SFEI, to develop an actionable, inclusive, and publicly informed statewide plastics monitoring plan intended to incorporate existing trash monitoring methods as well as these forthcoming microplastics monitoring methods. Despite the numerous state requirements and programs, including the State Water Board trash amendments, which were adopted in 2015, as well as a recent Plastic Pollution Prevention and Packaging Producer Responsibility Act, established, exactly right, <laughs> established by Senate Bill 54 this past uh, summer, by authored by Senator Ben Allen, uh, there is no consistent large plastic or microplastics monitoring program statewide. Together, these projects will form the needed foundation to physically implement a statewide plastics monitoring network to track state progress, as well as leverage existing and emerging data efforts across local, state, and federal partners, following the principle that you can't manage what you can't measure. Next slide, please. Finally, at the forefront of California's microplastic strategy, is a recognition that plastic pollution is pervasive, but it's preventable. On April 19th of 2022, Los Angeles County became the largest local government in California to restrict single-use plastic foodware um, items in restaurants, stores, hospital cafeterias, and food trucks. The ordinance aims to address plastic waste by requiring that food facilities only use food service ware that is recyclable, compostable, or reusable. It bans the retail sale of expanded polystyrene, and requires that full service restaurants use reusable food service ware for dine-in customers. Staff seeks approval of disbursement of approximately $417,000 to support direct outreach and education to help restaurants and business, businesses physically meet these new requirements as soon as possible to eliminate the use of single-use plastics and support public outreach and education. Next slide, please. California has the opportunity to take meaningful action through plastic source reduction using Los Angeles County as a case study and model to advance research and monitoring to fill key knowledge gaps and to inform effective future management of plastic pollution and essentially reduce this contamination in California waters. For this reason, we seek your approval of the disbursement of nearly, or excuse me, over $3.2 million to support these projects that span research, planning and monitoring, as well as implementation. Next slide is my thank you, and I'm available for any questions.
Thank you very much, Caitlin. Let's first move to public comment. And if you're here in person, if you can come up to the front to share public comment. Um, we've got a couple people here. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Hello, OPC Council members. I'm Amy Wolfram, Senior Manager for Monterey Bay Aquarium of Ocean Conservation Policy. As Caitlin detailed, we know plastic pollution has serious, if not fatal, impacts on marine animals. I'm here in support of all three items, 7A, 7B, and 7C, for the Microplastic Research Program, the development of a statewide plastics monitoring network, and the funds for technical support and implementation for LA County single-use plastics policy. We appreciate all of the advocacy that has gone on in, in the LA single-use plastics ordinance. As we seek to implement SB 54, OPC's investment and Los Angeles's leadership will be an important example of how we can meaningfully reduce single-use plastics. And I'm sure we'll learn a lot. Thank you, Caitlin and OPC for your continued work on this very complex issue. Thanks, Amy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Danny Kaur. I'm with the Ocean Conservancy. I'm a Ray Science Fellow. Uh, Ocean Conservancy strongly supports the proposals before you to improve coastal and ocean water quality by addressing plastic pollution. We appreciate the Council's history of supporting research and action to address plastic pollution, and today we're especially urging OPC to approve items 7A and 7B. In the last 10 years of the Ocean Conservancy-led International Coastal Cleanup in California, uh, volunteers have collected over 1.5 million pieces of microplastics from California beaches and waterways. Mm. Microplastics are pervasive in our waters and exposure to microplastics has been proven to adversely affect marine life. The research proposed to increase understanding of microplastic pollution that 7A's funding would support would inform management by helping to identify important sources of microplastic entry to the environment and prevention strategies. A statewide plastics monitoring network would greatly expand current knowledge of plastic pollution in California's waters and communities, and Ocean Conservancy is actively engaged in efforts to study the spread of plastic pollution. We greatly support this initiative to pursue this research in California. The items 7A and 7B also specifically call for partnerships with local community-based organizations and Native nations is critical and appreciated. The effects of plastic pollution might have disproportionate impacts on communities depending on many factors, and it is so important to design research collaboratively along members from these communities that are dis disproportionately impacted and traditionally underrepresented. Thank you to Caitlin Kalua and the rest of the OPC staff for your work to ready these proposals, and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Hey there. Good afternoon, Secretary Crowfoot and members of the council. Jennifer Fearing, I just want to echo the remarks of my colleagues and thank Caitlin for her hard work on this. And we're enthusiastically supportive. And the folks at the Nature Conservancy also ask that I convey their strong support. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for you and so many else uh, others, including our uh, council member, Senator Ben Allen, for championing uh, plastics pollution legislation reform uh, over the last year. You know, Caitlin, powerful presentation. Two facts I'd, I'd raise or emphasize. One is quite a discouraging fact. That is an estimate by 2040, uh, the amount of plastics contaminating the ocean will triple. And then secondly, you identified the problem as pervasive but preventable. Uh, and in a world with so many environmental challenges that are sometimes so complex, the notion of using less single-use plastics and um, and wasting less single-use plastics is mind-lumbingly simple. So I'm so excited to help build just the understanding of, of the level of microplastics that we have in our systems, environmental systems and our uh, ana anatomical systems. Uh, and I think in addition to monitoring and understanding just the scope of the problem, I'm excited to understand how OPC can help uh, publicize the problem because I think when more people understand the public health crisis as it is, then you know there'll be even more action. And I'm really glad to support Los Angeles County's leadership. And I think that's a great example of a state local partnership to tackle the problem in a meaningful way. So thank you for the thoughtful recommendations. Other council members? All right, uh, council member Diamond. 
I, I'm I'm so sorry. I I have my hand up, but I can't seem to be able to turn oh, my video so, back. So so sorry, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor. Please please all proceed. Right. Let's see if the if they can give me permission to open my video again. There it is. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so I strongly support this, and and um, this is a really extraordinary moment. I think for the OPC to be able to move forward with something that is so existentially important here in the state of California. And uh, I'm sure that this has been um, a very complicated interagency approach to coming up with a way to uh, advance the research that we need to do to understand the impact of microplastics on our people and our health and our state. I did have one question, Mr. Chair. Um, I, if staff could uh, answer it. Um, one thing that I think has been um, misunderstood is um, this sort of transition away from single use plastic bags. Um, I think most people notice, particularly during the pandemic when, uh, when um, you couldn't bring your own bag to the grocery store, that these bags started appearing and have appeared now for several years in grocery stores that are heavy duty plastic bags. Mm -hmm. And um, I know, you know, many people find themselves confused because if plastic bags are banned, why, why are all the plastic bags back? And why are there, they so much uh, more heavy duty? And the idea being, of course, that these are considered to be multi-use plastic bags, not single-use plastic bags. Um, but I think for most people, they don't end up using these multiple times or certainly any more frequently than they would have used a lighter weight plastic bag. So because the issue of plastic bags was so much tied to marine health, and again, because we also know the plastic film is not recyclable, these people should know that, um, I'm wondering whether or not this is going to be part of the study, um, whether they are, they are um, part of the microplastics challenge, uh, and whether or not we can look forward to some additional information about the use of plastic bags now again so widely in our, in our grocery stores and retail outlets. Certainly, I'll start there. I'm um, thinking to projects both 7A and 7B. Well, quite frankly, all, all projects, they probably can have a <laughs> directed answer for 7C as well. But um, thinking for 7A, specifically for researching explicit sources as well as management actions, it is a broad uh, research call that will have a priority areas, quite frankly, um, outlined in the Ocean Science Trust assessment report in 2021 that identified, for example, agricultural sources are a huge gap in knowledge in California. So there will be some prompts, um, but it's not necessarily an exhaustive list. So it will be um, broad for the research community. However, on that specific piece of actual here's a substitute product, I think it's a big question for then 7B when we are looking to develop this statewide plastics plan that is going to be a huge part of the effort as far as identifying what are the questions we're trying to answer is it only plastic occurrence are we seeing trends of specific products so i think that will be a huge information source um, and something that quite frankly could be part of that conversation and maybe needs to be and then the third is then that waste infrastructure and so that's where i'm kind of thinking the 7c realm where there is this term recyclable um, requiring products be recyclable. And as a, count, a council mem member and Lieutenant Governor Kanalakis, you very rightly point to saying, okay, it's defined as multi-use, therefore it's it's allowed. Well, what does that mean for actual then recycling infrastructure? Is it actually being recycled? So um, I think it's a wonderful point. And I think it has to be a consideration across uh, potentially all three. I, I will leave 7A largely to the research community and the proposals they present. But Yeah, and then I might just add, um, I think that's a really prescient question from the lieutenant governor and just ask maybe as a as a comment or request to, to figure out how that could be integrated because i i just had that personal experience lieutenant governor where i went to safeway and i forgot my bags and i bought a ton of groceries and of course the only option were these plastic bags that you know don't are not fully you know reusable like like, like the bags that we reuse so 
I'm with you, Lieutenant Governor, I think, which is to really understand what is the impact um, on the on the plastic pollution of these bags. Well, and and even again, because it was so tied to ocean um, uh, threats to to ocean life as part of the reason to do away with plastic bags in the grocery store, has this switch to these quote unquote, you know, so-called multi-use plastic bags, has that resulted, is, is there a notable difference in, in pollution in our ocean as a result? And maybe some of our partners um, uh, are, are able to weigh in on that as well as, as this work is underway. If I may add to that, I think it's actually great. I left off one graph for brevity. Um, there's a wonderful data source from the Southern California Bite Monitoring Program. It's only from 2013 to 2018. We're specifically looking at different sources of plastics, overlaying that with, let's say, lo local ordinances or uh, timing of statewide uh, requirements to include the statewide implementation of the plastic bag ban. And so it did show in Santa Monica watersheds, there was a... Um, statistically significant decrease in plastic bags that were then observed in, in Southern California watersheds, the Southern California Bite. So that's very promising data. I pause because again, it's only from that five-year window and I would be curious how that then translates potentially to these thicker, you know, alternative products. So that's, wanted to share it as one data source we do have, but it's, you know, certainly only one. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think we owe the Lieutenant Governor an answer in several months or a couple of years in terms of what are the what is the impact of, of sort of reintroducing these heavy plastic bags for, for use. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Council Member Brown. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, kind of um, playing or going a little further on the Lieutenant Governor's comments, uh, how... I, how or where in the program are the non-single use plastics that we know, such as um, fiber, textile fibers, uh, that are entering the marine environment as well as elsewhere in the environment? Um, how are they figuring in into these three um, items. I would say other sources that include fibers as well as other items not including just single-use food where, if I understand your question correctly, is um, certainly evaluating the full gamut of plastic sources and um, causing contamination in the environment is the scope of research call under 7A as well as 7B is that it's not only to evaluate single-use plastics but plastics period. You know, it is occurrence, but also potential analysis of specific polymer types, specific sources, um, and identifying those those priority compounds, which quite frankly do in, include fibers as one example. So I would say uh, very well integrated. It's not only single-use foodware. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And just a note to thank our colleagues at the California Environmental Protection Agency and CalRecycle for their you know, ongoing partnerships on microplastics. I want to recognize, oh, their jurisdiction on that. And so sorry, council member. Not at all, not at all. Um, apparently I'm going to speak on every item so you don't no. miss me in future <laughs> meetings. Um, but no, I just wanted to say, um, and Caitlin, fantastic presentation and fantastic work over many years on, on this. Um, plastics, they're a pervasive issue for the oceans, but they're possibly the single greatest <laughs> environmental issue we're facing, period. Whether you're talking from a climate change perspective, they're derived from fossil fuels, whether you're talking from a public health perspective, both you know um, during the processing of them and then obviously the aftermath and obviously their, their presence in the oceans and the environment generally. So really grateful for, this is an area where OPC has not just been proactive, but actually innovative and leading from the first microplastic strategy to, I mean, working with LA, to my knowledge, this is the first time we've been partnering with a local government to really kind of um, work on, on this implementation. Um, so I, I just want to kind of commend and emphasize just how great this work is. I also specifically want to call out for um, for 7A, for looking at the microplastics research program, 
partnering with California Sea Grant in particular on this um, and with the Sea Grant program with their ability to not just look at California, but they also have the network to pass on the findings, which, which are down at a granular detail, which are not the easiest things to pass along, right? But they have the network to really expand this beyond California since this is a bigger than us issue. Um, so just strongly supportive of that. I think it's a, a fantastic partnership. Thanks so much. Any final council members? Uh, Chair Crawford, could I add one more comment? Please. Um, I forgot to add or mention, um, bio-based plastics are becoming a thing. They have been a thing for quite a while, um, but lots of folks are looking at those as an alternative to fossil fuel-based plastics. And um, I hope, and particularly in 7A, that there'll be some, in some way, shape, or form, some inclusion of looking at the role of bio-based plastics, which may be good or bad or somewhere in between um, when that comes around. One within the research call, uh, there will be a piece that is, it's very specific to plastic dose response regarding ecological sensitivity. I'd have to relook at what has been um, vetted essentially for that research call to see if, it, if there is that comparison, but more on to the point, and I think very um, poignant to your point, and uh, is a partnership between OPC, the State Water Board, um, as well as other Cal EPA agencies. Um, it's still very much in development, but evaluating um, plastic alternatives and whether that be a workshop or some other effort coming in the future is that that is a large question that is, I think, very front and center, front of mind. So if it's not included in the 7A solicitation, it's absolutely front and center in the conversations happening in the agency level with hopefully, quite frankly, public either findings, questions, et cetera, being more publicly available. Got it. And as I understand it, council member, really using the work at OPC to understand what is the impact of these so-called bio-based uh, plastics. Yeah, certainly. And that's that's part of understanding the life cycle analysis. I know one example is like methanol or corn that could have an additional impacts as far as the actual life cycle from production to then, you know, physically being in your hand. So I think there's a lot, a lot to evaluate and to assess. Thank you. Thank you again, Caitlin. So do we have a motion on this oh, item? I apologize, Secretary Crowfoot. We still have a virtual public comment. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Deep in the agenda. So uh, my apologies. No worries. We have five hands up. I'm going to start with Simone um, Schmidt because she has a slide she provided to us. Simone, you have the floor. Perfect. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Simone Schmidt. Uh, I wanted to start by saying I appreciate the work that the OPC does to protect our ocean biodiversity and equity. It was nice to see in the 10 actions in 2021 that you would give grants to local agencies to implement reusable foodware ordinances. Now LA County is being awarded with over $400,000. The county did an awesome job in community outreach when they were drafting the ordinance. The implementation would also be great with the grant. Hopefully this would encourage other politicians to ban plastics. But this ordinance is not perfect. It should not exempt street vendors from the styrofoam ban. Almost no restaurant is closer to storm drains and waterways than street vendors. The county should unexempt them as soon as possible before other agencies follow suit. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Our next speaker is going to be Heather Podal, followed by Craig. Catawalder, and then Emily Parker. Heather, you have the floor. Thank you. This is Heather Podal speaking on behalf of the nonprofit Fiber Shed. We applaud OPC's prioritization of source reduction in the statewide microplastic strategy and moves to implement its recommendations. As OPC and California Sea Grant award funding for microplastics research, we hope you will continue to prioritize true source reduction. Even when temporarily prevented from entering waterways through filtration, including low impact development BMPs, microplastics can continue to be transferred between terrestrial and aquatic systems. 
Textiles inherently shed microfibers during manufacturing, use, laundering, and after their useful life. All of these materials will eventually end up in our aquatic and terrestrial environments and in the bodies of organisms that live there. Source reduction must facilitate textile industry shifts toward use of non-toxic and biodegradable materials. So these materials can cycle within our ecosystems without causing harm. In the textile industry, we continue to see alarming levels of annual growth in use of synthetic materials. Some synthetic textiles are increasingly marketed as sustainable, fueling growth in their production and heightened market demand. Differentiating between textile materials that generate microplastic microfibers and those that have capacity for harmless natural biodegradation is essential to develop effective policy and market solutions. Natural fiber products derived from California farms and ranches implementing climate smart agriculture can be an important part of the solutions we need. Finally, we ask you consider including airborne transport of microplastics in monitoring and risk thresholds, including exposure and impacts for workers in textile manufacturing and garment workers. We're extremely grateful for the work of OPC and its partners. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Our next speaker is going to be Craig Cadwalder, followed by Emily Parker, and lastly, William Lane. Craig, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Chair Crowfoot and council members. My name is Craig Cadwalader, and I'm with the South Bay chapter in the Los Angeles area of the Surfrider Foundation. Both the Los Angeles chapter and South Bay chapters are two of the 80 Surfrider chapters and student clubs in California. We support the suggested distribution of funds in under seven A, B, and C, and ask the council members for their approval. The, the development of microplastics research and statewide plastic and microplastic monitoring is an essential step in better understanding microplastics contamination in California waters. We appreciate the equity and environmental justice considerations and believe that conducting proactive outreach once the request for proposal is announced will be critical for the competitive call for microplastics research program, international, added efforts along with support will be necessary in order to go beyond the pool and diversity of applicants typically seen by the Ocean Protection Council and California Sea Grant. In particular, we are in strong support of Agenda 7C. We work closely with our partners and are very excited for LA County single-use plastic ordinance uh, of which I personally have worked on for over 12 years and so happy that this was finally approved. Implementation will be critical and the additional support from the OPC will support essential outreach to ensure strong compliance with the ordinance. In addition to local government agencies, we encourage close collaboration with community organizations that might be able to support the work and have existing relationships with impacted business and compensation for their work. Thank, uh, we look forward to continuing engagement with the Ocean Protection Council and sincerely thank Caitlin for her leadership and dedication on this critical talk, but thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is going to be Emily, followed by William. Emily, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Secretary Crofa and Honorable Council Members. My name is Emily Parker, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Heal the Bay, an environmental nonprofit organization based in the LA region on unceded Tongva and Chumash land with over 35 years of experience dedicated to making the coastal waters and watersheds of LA healthy, safe, and clean. Heal the Bay would like to commend OPC members and staff today for an impressive agenda of projects and programs to protect the health of California's marine and coastal ecosystems. We want to express our support today for all of the plastics action items being considered under item seven today, including the development of a statewide plastics monitoring program. In particular, we'd like to provide our strong support for the funding allocation to the County of Los Angeles for technical support and implementation of their single use plastics ordinance. As the co-founder and co-leader of the Reusable LA Coalition, I have personally been deeply involved in the development of this ordinance since its first stage nearly four years ago. Our team dedicated countless hours to this ordinance through language drafting, survey research, and community organizing. 
We acted as essential stakeholders and provided technical expertise at each critical stage. And thanks to our commitment and the hard work of the LA County Chief Office of Sustainability, the dream of passing this law is now reality. While not perfect, this ordinance is a major step for LA County and stands to make a huge difference in reducing plastic pollution. This ordinance is only as good as its implementation and that requires designated funding. The technical assistance offered today by the OPC to provide a designated website, outreach materials, compliant product lists, and direct communication with affected businesses will ensure that this new law truly reduces plastic pollution and associated harm while really benefiting local businesses and the community. Heal the Bay is very much looking forward to working with LA County to provide our own expertise as this project is implemented, and we're thrilled to see the state take a vested interest in LA and this law. We thank the council and the county of LA for their leadership today, and we strongly support this allocation of funding. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Our last speaker is going to be William Lane. William, you have the floor. William, you're still on mute. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Bill Lane, and I'm a member of the Dana Point Ocean Water Quality Subcommittee. I applaud the Ocean Protection Council's authorization to support Los Angeles County's single-use plastic ordinance. LA County is a leader and positively influences other cities in the state. Capturing trash, education, and cleanup efforts are important, but have limitations. Trash reduction at its source is paramount. And as a parting request, it's that the council considers the challenge of how to inspire and incentivize smaller, more conservative jurisdictions like Dana Point to embrace regulations, regulations that advance source reduction policies. We down here in Dana Point are thankful for all the hard work that you're doing. William, thank you. We may have lost him in midstream, but we did get the thrust of his comments. So let's move then back to council consideration of the item. Is there a motion to approve item number seven? So moved. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Second? Second. Council Member Diamond seconds. Holly, please call the roll. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Aye. Right, Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. Council Member Landau. Aye. Council Member Jordan. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. The council has voted unanimously. The motion passes. Thank you so much to all the groups that are uh, supporting this effort and Caitlin for your excellent presentation. Let's move on to item number eight. Another item focused on enhancing our coastal and marine biodiversity. It's uh, an, an action item and it is for the consideration and approval of the disbursement of funds to support estuarine marine protected area monitoring. Welcome, Lindsay Bonito. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, good afternoon, council members and Chair Crowfoot. I'm Lindsay Benito, the MPA Program Manager, and I'm uh, pleased to share a recommendation for continued support for our Estuarine MPA Monitoring Program. Next slide, please. Linz, can you pull the mic a little bit closer? Closer. The project I'm sharing with you today directly supports OPC Strategic Goal 3, specifically Objective 3.1, which directs us to um, support the MPA decal management review and continued management actions, including, including monitoring. Next slide, please. As you might recall, this council approved funding at its November 2019 meeting to establish a statewide monitoring consortium for California's estuarine marine protected areas. The project team, co-led by the Central Coast Wetlands Group and the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, or SCORP, were tasked to develop research questions and indicators guided by the MPA Monitoring Action Plan, develop standardized monitoring protocols, pilot test these protocols to uh, complete baseline assessment of these estuarine MPAs, and develop an approach for a long-term coordinated statewide estuary monitoring um, program into the future. And the project team has done just that. The previously funded project has established an integrated monitoring framework with these standardized protocols and data management tools, all of which can be found on the project team's website. A key aspect of this uh, unique framework is a focus on structural elements of estuaries that represent specific ecological functions like nutrient cycling, 
rather than a single species approach. This focus on function allows the framework to accommodate different types of estuaries under the monitoring framework and compile data from existing monitoring programs. Next slide, please. The team took their newly established protocols into the field to conduct baseline assessments and found that SUAs are highly variable systems with many factors influencing MPA performance. Within the 15 sites sampled statewide, physical metrics of SUAs are highly variable and are driven in part by temperature and salinity. However, the type of estuary, season, and region all play important factors. While there were some differences in the fish communities based on MPA designation, estuary type and survey method were big, bigger contributors in this variability. Overall, the research team found that estuary mouth type, whether it's open or closed, plays a huge role in determining the condition and species found within an estuary. Next slide. While well, we've provided initial investment to establish this monitoring program, continued monitoring is critically important to deepen our understanding of how MPA protections influence species abundance in this very complex ecosystem. Uh, we've only just begun uh, setting up this monitoring program, so it'll take a few more years to really see the effects of MPA protections in this place. We know that estuaries are critically important habitats at the nexus of land and sea. It's well known that they provide important habitats supporting biodiversity and ecosystem services, including food provisioning, water purification, garbage storage, sea level rise buffering, just to name a few. The research conducted by this group has already provided valuable analyses that were included in the recently released Decale Management Review of the MPA Network, and their continued monitoring will inform the planned revision of the MPA Monitoring Action Plan moving forward. Next slide, please. Given the established need for continued monitoring of these important systems, I'd like to recommend the Council approves the disbursement of $750,000 to the San Jose State University Research Foundation to support continued monitoring of estuary MPAs for the 2023 field season. Next slide. Thank you so much for your time and attention today and happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Let's move to any public comment, either here in the room or virtually. I have a couple of virtual hands if we have no one in person. Um, first is gonna be Lily Mulligan followed by Mr. Sadowski. Lily, you have the floor. Thank you. Once again, this is Lily Mulligan from Wild Coast. Wild Coast would like to support action item number eight, approving the disbursement of funds to support estuarine MPA monitoring. California's estuary MPAs are some of the most important ecosystems in the world as they provide an extensive list of ecosystem services, benefiting both human and wildlife populations, as Lindsay mentioned in her presentation. Therefore, it is critical that funding be allocated to assessing and monitoring these key ecosystems. Once again, on behalf of Wild Coast, I would like to thank you for your time and support of action, action item number eight. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Our next speaker is going to be Richard Sadowski, followed by Daniel Glusenkamp. Mr. Sadowski, you have the floor. Thank you. Richard Sadowski, Homefront EJ, Morrill Bay. Um, I'm totally in support of funding for MPA monitoring. And in fact, we should expand the variables of, the, of what we are monitoring. And in, in particular, um, uh, dealing with ocean acidification. We, um, we are uh, currently collaborating with the California University of uh, San Luis Obispo on our project, uh, which is called MBEAM, Morro Bay Estuary Air Monitoring Project. And um, we um, are uh, also collaborating with the College Core Program and have two interns working with, with us on collaborating with the Carbon Lab in their study of ocean acidification, taking water samples while we give them uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide readings while they're doing that. And one of the best ways to get the word out is getting the young people involved and let them, let, you know, let them run with it, you know? And uh, I think that that's, uh, uh, that's so important right now that we, we don't, we don't backtrack on, 
on research and we and we keep moving forward on giving the the young people the tools they need to uh that they're going to need to deal with the problems that are um of climate uh, climate change and, and i like to thank um councilman brown for the kind words earlier thank you thanks so much i'm glad you heard those our next and last speaker is going to be Daniel Gleason-Camp. Daniel, you have the floor. Daniel, you're still muted. Sorry about that mute. Yeah, uh, Dan Gleason-Camp with the California Institute for Biodiversity. Looks like we lost Daniel for a second there. One moment, Daniel, let's try this again. Hi, well, a lot of fanfare. Uh, Dan Gleason Camp with the California Institute for Biodiversity. Am I coming through this time? Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so I want to echo Secretary Crowfoot in thanking staff for their professionalism and for leading with science. It's quite inspirational and we really need it. We're calling in support of item number eight. We're deeply concerned about coastal biodiversity and strongly support this kind of monitoring. And we're especially concerned about intertidal biodiversity, where scientists believe that there may be thousands of species yet to be described and named by science. And of course, we fear that these species are going to be lost forever due to pollution, disease, and the massive habitat changes we'll see due to sea level rise. So we really feel like we need basic biodiversity exploration now while it's even possible. Um, so all of these projects are great, but a lot more is needed. We want to echo what Laura from Surfrider and, and a bunch of others have said, and call for more, not less investment in the upcoming budget as we all work with the legislature and the governor to try and build a sustainable California. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, appreciate those comments. I think that brings public comment to a close and to turn it back to the council members for any questions or comments. I have one simple question. You mentioned um, the, the final grant recommendation uh, being in time for 2023 field season. And I'm just wondering what is the field season for this type of estuary research? Um, for this past year, they did two different seasons in a year. So it's really important to understand the seasonality of this particular estuary. So it's it's likely that they'll continue to do two different seasons, but it's a ton of fun. If you're interested in going out, let me know. But it's a uh, beach staining. They do um, video work underwater, um, all sorts of um, in water and on the beach monitoring. So happy to dig into more if you'd like. Got it. I sense a field trip potentially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Uh, Questions, council members, Lieutenant Governor. Just um, uh, remembering that I believe that I was here in 2019 when we uh, approved uh, the first round of this funding. Um, and I'm just so proud of all the folks, all the experts and the students and, and um, faculty at uh, San Jose State for doing uh, this work in partnership. It's just such a great testament to the kind of thing we can do in the state of California. So very exciting. I would absolutely agree with you. And I took note when Mr. Sadowski said he's working with two College Corps students that are helping with research. College Corps is a program that provides $10,000 to uh, college students to offset the cost of college to do community-based service. So, so great that College Corps is informing this work as well. Councilman Brown. Okay. No, no, no comment. Okay, okay. Great work. Great job, Lindsay. Um, and, and I will just say, um, there's so many things that we work on that are front and center and that people understand the issues about. Estuaries are not a sexy topic. Um, and I'm so proud of OPC for continuing long-term engagement on one of the most critical parts of our ecosystem. I tried to explain, <laughs> explain brackish water to my five-year-old recently. He was not excited, no matter how much I emphasized how important <laughs> this was as part of the <laughs> ecosystem. But just thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> thank you. So do we have a motion on item number eight? Uh, I'll move to uh, distribute the $750,000 um, to San Jose State University Research Foundation for the assessment and monitoring of California's estuary marine protected areas. Thank you so much. Is there a second? Second. Uh, okay, Lieutenant Governor seconds. Holly, please call the roll. Lieutenant Governor Knolakis. Aye. Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. Councilmember Landau? Aye. 
Council Member Jordan. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. The council has voted unanimously. The motion passes. Thanks so much for the good work, Lindsay and team. Let's move to item number nine, which is the last action item on the agenda, and it's a consent item. We have a consent calendar for <clears throat> minor decisions that we don't prepare a presentation for, but we could certainly answer questions. And this is uh, this consent item is consideration and approval of a minor budget augmentation of a grant that was previously approved through the executive director's delegated authority, and it's to the California Fishermen's Resiliency Association to enhance industry to industry cooperation on offshore wind fishing community benefit agreements. Um, the additional funding supports the commercial and recreational fishing sectors participation in a working group required by the Coastal Commission's consistency determinations for two uh, wind energy call areas. And it takes the original $199,000 grant and augments it by $45,000. Um, is there, I'm seeing no questions. Is there a motion to approve the consent item? Councilmember Diamond? Yeah, if I could actually just make one quick comment yeah. on just how incredibly important this is for engagement on offshore wind planning. We just had the first lease sales uh, last month um, in the state. And this particular issue of providing capacity for fishermen to engage in these critically important conversations that directly affect them. Um, I'm just really proud of OPC for providing this funding. Um, if I could write a check, I would. Um, so just, um, I, just, just huge support for this incredibly important action. So I guess that counts as moving to approve. <laughs> well, I'll just note, I mean, thank you for bringing that up. And I'll just note, we held a public forum on uh, wind, offshore wind power, and it was attended by over 600 people virtually. And large, you know, um, really strong support, but uh, fishing groups continue to be concerned about potential impacts. So ensuring that they have the capacity to be in the middle of this conversation uh, is critically important. So thank you for raising that. And I will take your motion. So we have a motion from Council Member Diamond to approve the consent item. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Council Member Brown seconds. Holly, please call the roll. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Aye. Secretary Crowfoot. Aye. Councilmember Landau? Aye. Councilmember Jordan? Aye. Councilmember Brown? Aye. The council has voted unanimously. The motion passes. Thank you. The next to last item is an important item for us, and that is to entertain any public comment uh, on the topics we cover that is not directly related to the agenda. Obviously, the, the work we do and the work our staff does uh, covers a broad range of topics not always discussed within the agenda. So I would invite members of the public that would like to make public comment on non-agenda items to come up to the podium now. If you are here at the Natural Resources Agency headquarters, which we've got a couple of uh, public commenters, and then anybody who'd like to join public comment virtually uh, by Zoom or by phone, please do so by that virtual hand if you're on Zoom or by pound two if you're on phone. Welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. Council member. Uh, my name is Ben Grundy and I'm the conservation associate with Environment California, a statewide advocacy group that works to protect our air, our water, and our open spaces. I would first like to thank the council for your commitment to protecting California's rich marine ecosystems and efforts to engage the public in California's conservation future. I'm here today to speak in support of California's continued ambition when it comes to managing our network of marine protected areas. As mentioned today, in 2020, California became the first state to set the ambitious goal of protecting 30% of our land and coastal waters by 2030. This landmark commitment not only made the state a statewide and nation leader, but also a global leader on ocean conservation. While approximately 16% of California's coastal waters are conserved, only 9% have the level of protection needed that scientists say is needed to defend against biodiversity loss and climate change. California's unique network of 124 marine protected areas makes the state a global leader in protecting the critical habitats and life existing in and around our oceans. However, with a warming planet, rising sea level, and historic species extinctions, it's clear that California must strengthen and expand our existing network. Highly and fully protected marine protected areas provide space for marine life to rebound from harmful stressors so that they are more resilient and can better adapt to changing ocean conditions from climate change. The adoption of more highly and fully protected marine areas is critical to protect our marine life from being harmed by destructive and extractive human activities. 
It's extremely encouraging to see the approval of funding today for estuary marine protections and also projects to understand the interconnection between MPAs and climate resiliency. And I look forward to the Council's continued work and leadership in the state's efforts to create a science-based pathway for new MPAs during the decadal management review process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi again, council members, Jennifer Fearing, um, this time on behalf of a number of the nonprofits I'm really, really fortunate to work with and represent in Sacramento, Ocean Conservancy, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, Pew, and the National Wildlife Federation. And if there had been public comment on the first item, I would have shared this then. So instead, I will drag us back to the topic of just how thrilled we are that Jen Eckerly has been <laughs> named the executive director. We cannot she is a person that we have known and worked with, the sort of one of us, a worker bee who has cared about the environment for all of her working life. And it gives us pleasure both as her colleagues and as women to see her rise to this leadership position. And we want to acknowledge the governor's great sense to appoint her to that, <laughs> to that position. Um, I just wanted to quickly also mention um, for the benefit of other OPC members, just how important it was that you, Mr. Secretary and Jen were in Montreal um, to lift up the ocean, make sure it was heard um, around the world as the biodiversity convention um, was made great strides. Um, and California played such an important role at that. But thank you for representing the ocean there. Um, thank you, Jordan and Michael, for your leadership over many years. Um, and we can only hope to have similarly wise and thoughtful folks take your place. So thank you for all you've done. And then lastly, but not least, um, for those who don't know, the federal government, the, gov the president signed legislation at the end of last year that made the drift gill net transition off California's coast a federal, it's federal law. Um, California initiated that, OPC led with the funding of that transition, and we just couldn't be more thrilled to have seen that the sort of door closed behind that year and a, the opportunity now with federal funds to transition the last um, of the fishermen to, to cleaner gear type. So thank you for all you've done on that. Thank you very much for all that acknowledgement and that update. That's an exciting update, very exciting update. Let's turn it over to Holly for any virtual public comment. For virtual comment, we'll be starting with Walter Lamb since he provided some slides. Uh, Mr. Lamb, I can't run a timer since we have numerous slides, so I will chime in when your two minutes are up. Uh, you now have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, good afternoon, Secretary Crowfoot, honorable council members. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, just these images are from the last couple of days, uh, the seasonal wetlands that we get every year, every winter in the wet season. And this is south and southeast. This is particularly southeast area B. And this is the area that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is currently focusing its efforts to try to, um, you know, do some sort of engineering work. And as part of that, they've said that they, they've claimed, along with a couple other natural resources agencies, that this is an area of the reserve that has been hydrologically starved from its water source for many decades. And a little bit of concern that natural resources agencies would be sort of speaking hyperbolically like that. There may, may be potential to incrementally improve the hydrology here, always open for improvement. Um, but you can see that this is not an area that's been starved from its water source. This is exactly what's supposed to be there. It's a seasonal wetland. It won't look like this in the summer, and it's not supposed to. Um, see a lot of different wildlife, waterfowl. If you can go to the next slide, um, just to sort of for contrast, we have some dire need in many areas of the reserve for basic stewardship, clash, uh, trash cleanup, invasive weed removal, just general maintenance. And this is being delayed by the effort to push forward some sort of engineering, something that will have a groundbreaking ceremony is, is what it seems to us. That, they're, that they're, Rather than going and, and working and caring for the land, you know, most basic stewardship. And I just want to go on record saying that, you know, I can understand it's been a long time that this has been in the works and it hasn't gone anywhere. It's sort of spinning in circles. And it seems to us that there's a big push now from the Newsom administration to get something, anything across the finish line. And that needs to be something still that's well thought out. And, and right now what we have is not well thought out. And I don't think there's going to be a groundbreaking ceremony, but there could be, you know, in the very short near term, a ground celebration ceremony 
where we get out and we start to take care of the land. And we hope that, that is time, Mr. Lamb. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walter. Our next speaker is going to be Amalia Almada, followed by phone number last four digits, 5936, and then David Helbog. Amalia, you have the floor. You're on muted and have the floor, Amalia. We're gonna go ahead and move on to last phone, phone number, last four digits, 5936. Amalia, if you want to still speak, please raise your hand again. Uh, phone number 5936, you have the floor. Eileen Boken, State and Federal Legislative Liaison, Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods. The coalition's ocean focus is on the waters off San Francisco's ocean beach. Since 2014, the coalition has been advocating for this area to be included in the National Marine Sanctuary System. The coalition has also advocated for this National Marine Sanctuary status at the State Lands Commission. Now that California has adopted its own 30 by 30 strategy as an offshoot of the Biden administration's 30 by 30 strategy, the coalition will be advocating for a National Marine Sanctuary designation in conjunction with the state 30 by 30 strategy. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and try Amalia again. Amalia, you have the floor. Hear me now. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Amalia Aruda Almada. I'm a science research and policy specialist with the Sea Grant program at the University of Southern California. I'd like to share that the University of Southern California Sea Grant program has opened its biennial call for research proposals that contribute to solving the particular problems associated with urbanization on and adjacent to the coastal zone. Our preliminary proposals are due by March 1st, 2023, and more details can be found on the USC Sea Grant website. I'd also like to echo and build on OST Executive Director Dr. Whiteman's earlier remarks about recent developments around the deep ocean DDT issue in Southern California. Again, thank you, Liz, for mentioning the release of the report last week um, titled The Deep Ocean DDT Research Needs Assessment for the Southern California Bite. Just wanted to thank again all of the generous time and expertise that we received from DDT technical experts and engaged community members over the last year. We're incredibly thankful for the partnership with this growing DDT community and again to all of our state and federal partners in this work. And thank you to OST for helping to facilitate an open briefing this Thursday about the report. We really encourage you all to register on OST's website and thank you to OPC and Jen Eckerly for participating in this briefing as well. And finally, as Dr. Whiteman mentioned, a request for proposals to support deep ocean DDT research in California is now open. Thank you to state water boards, OPC and the state for their partnership with USC and California Sea Grant to facilitate really an inclusive, competed research call for much needed deep ocean DDT work. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Amata. Next speaker is going to be David Helbarg, followed by Dana No, and then Mr. Sadowski. David, you have the floor. David, you're still muted. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is David Helvard. I'm a writer and executive director of Blue Frontier National Ocean Conservation Group based in Richmond, California. Uh, 10 years ago in 2013, my book, The Golden Shore, California's Love Affair with the Sea came out. In it, I suggested that with almost 40 million people in the world's fifth largest economy, California's proof you can grow world-class culture while protecting your coast and ocean. The San Francisco Chronicle wrote that the book just might make you optimistic about the future. Well, the future's arrived and I'm less optimistic due in large part to climate impacts on our coast, kelp forest and communities, both human and wild. While we're carrying out many great initiatives as we've seen throughout today, the level of risk we're facing requires a concomitant commitment of resources. The governor's proposed budget cuts for 2023-24 in response to a short-term deficit based on our state's fair but sometimes vulnerable tax structure 
could undermine the long-term security and economies of our coastal counties that generate 80% of the state's GDP. These cuts include a 45% reduction of 297 million for the Coastal Conservancy's Coastal Protection and Adaptation Programs and 69 million or 36% cut from this Ocean Protection Council, among other climate related programs being reduced. Governor can argue that some of this may be offset from new federal climate spending, including 10 billion for coastal protection and green ports. But if you're serious about California acting like a nation state, then we should maintain our position of leading from the front and remain a world template of a shining city by the shore. Um, confident Secretary Crowfoot will bring these concerns back to the governor and that the legislature will also take note. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is going to be Dana, followed by Mr. Sadowski. Dana, you have the floor. Hi, this is Dana Ngo and Michael Malecki with the Ocean Health and Ecological Security Institute of San Francisco. We would love to applaud all of the incredible initiatives being proposed here today. We would also like to recognize that with the interconnectedness of all the oceans, all of the incredible local initiatives need to be supported by a broader view of the toxicological threats from abroad. In this context, we would like to remind everyone that the nuclear waste from Fukushima has been proposed to release into the Pacific Ocean and is projected to accumulate on our California coasts. Recently, the National Association of Marine Laboratories, which includes local members such as Monterey Bay Research Aquarium and Stanford University and University of California and many more, have published a very strong position letter in opposition of this decision. And we recognize that this is an unprecedented threat to lo local ecological diversity and California waters. And this is despite the existence of alternatives and solutions. So we would love to ask what is the OPC's position on this issue and if there are any plans to address this very important issue to our local waters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. And uh, OPC staff is taking note of that and can hopefully answer your question. We'll be wrapping up public comment with Mr. Sadowski. Mr. Sadowski, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Richard Sadowski, Homefront EJ. I um, I love going to OPC meetings, just like the last last commenter. Um, these are the kind of things that we don't know, you know, until we hear about it. So, thank you, uh, previous speaker Dana. Um, I just want to also mention that I was really um, blessed by. Um, Senator Crowfoot's chairing of uh, yesterday's wind energy uh, webinar. And, and one of the things that was really encouraging and really needs to also be a focus is the jobs. There was a, a field engineer, I think his name was Jeff from Humboldt, and he was talking about pre-apprentice programs and using people from the oil industry and retraining and, and doing that. Those are the kind of things that will make you know, help get receptive listeners like, uh, the, for instance, fishermen. And what one of the things I would like to uh, just throw out there, and I know that it's under, you know, it's an R and D kind of thing, but you know, uh, the multi-purpose platforms where they use an uh, for the wind farm, using them for aquacultures too, and maybe using the fish local fishing community to to engage in that. And then the other thing uh, I would like to uh, mention is the support for the uh, Shumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary and and within those leases that uh, that the wind farm is going to have, it would be, you know, if there was some collaboration with um, uh, housing, uh, housing, housing authorities where they can have like affordable housing for researchers and people, climate scientists working in the local area as part of that uh, program. Once again, you, <clears throat> thank you so much uh, for you guys, all your work and uh, I love your hearts. Thank you so much as always for your presence and, and your creative suggestions. And I hope you stay plugged in, so to speak to the offshore wind power discussion definitely needs your, uh, your passion and commitment. So we are to the end of our agenda. I wanted to really provide the final word to a few colleagues here, but before I do, uh, I wanna 
announce that our next meeting of the OPC will be on Monday, April 24th, beginning at 1 p.m. here in the uh, Natural Resources Auditorium, but also online. And then we're planning meetings in August, on August 15th and December 12th. So as I started the discussion, this is both a hello and goodbye. It's a hello to a hello again to Lieutenant Governor and uh, her tremendous leadership on oceans. And thanks, Matt, for being here in person. Excited to work together once again. And then um, a, a thank you and farewell to Mike and Jordan. Uh, greatly appreciate all you've done over the last uh, several years. Um, we are on a journey and uh, and we are better off. We are further along thanks to uh, you being here and guiding this work. Just want any final thoughts each of you have after this very robust meeting. Uh, and if I can, because I'm gonna give you the final, final word, I just wanna compliment the OPC staff. Uh, you do such great work and you always bring such thoughtful and thorough presentations, but cogent and focused. And it lets us get a lot of work done in just a few hours. So thank you very much uh, for all that you do. Let me first turn to Mike and then I'll turn to Jordan. Uh, I just want to say this meeting exemplifies that um, OPC is a absolutely cutting edge example of the public sector interacting with the nonprofits and private sector and the universities and residents to do great things and uh, that benefit our um, ocean and, <clears throat> and coastal environment. So thank you all. Thank you all, Mike, and see you, see you again soon in Santa Barbara or maybe up here. <laughs> Jordan. Um, thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. I would just add my thanks to the staff. The number of times over the last four years when someone has praised me for something OPC has done, <laughs> when I get to sit up here and I mean, hear about all the amazing things that are doing and get to work with you guys on them, but you guys are doing all of the work and you do it with integrity and you do it with thought and you do it with care and also with speed. Um, so just thank you um, for, for all that you guys do. Thank you, Jen, for your service. Liz, thank you. Um, the cross-cutting nature of the work, both across kind of the state agencies in that coordinating role and also the interdisciplinary nature of this work is so critical for one of the world's most precious resources. Um, so just thank you. It's been a privilege. I um, really appreciate the chance to serve on the council. And I want to thank Secretary Crowfoot for his exemplary leadership. Um, I cannot imagine anyone who could have both balanced keeping things going and pushing things forward in the most supportive and productive and thoughtful manner. Um, so thank you also, Secretary Crowfoot. Thank you. And the work continues. Jen? You've got, uh, you've got a, a lot on your hands here. We're making such progress with so much, uh, with so much to look forward to. Thanks to all who joined today and we'll see you again in April. Thank you.